et c'est un peu ce qu'on et qui est et c'est un peu ce qu'on et qui est Et c'est un médium spontané qui est le CE. Günaydınlar diliyorum. Bugün aramızda 
katılımcılarımız dünyanın farklı ülkelerinden ve sizler de dahil olmak üzere bir kümar ve Türkiye'nin farklı yerlerinden geldiler. Bu panelin bu asıl amacı Gaziantep'i nasıl tekrar eski haline döndürebiliriz? Hatta eski haline daha iyi bir haline nasıl getirebiliriz diye ilgili konuları tartışmak, kendi aramızda bu konularla ilgili istiyatları belirlemek belki de sonrasında bu stratejileri uygulamaya koyma noktasında ne tür e, e, raporların sağlanabileceğini kendi aramızda görüp ve bunu ileriye doğru taşımak. And he said that, of course, I will be jumping in many areas where you know, our colleagues are going to be discussing. But first, let's try to see what has happened. As I was uh, mentioning, if you look at the Turkish context, we can see that last 100 years, we have experienced 269 large earthquakes. And uh, these earthquakes, among them we have seven plus magnitude earthquakes, which has caused uh, quite a big number of destruction in our cities. Uh, just giving an example, uh, when we look at the 1939 Erzincan earthquake, we could see that the whole city was disrupted, uh, more than 30,000 people were killed. And when we come today, uh, I mean recently, uh, back in 1999, Marmara earthquake caused uh, quite big destruction in Istanbul area, in Marmara area, where we have more than around maybe 20,000 casualties. But this earthquake has caused much more. So by records, this has been considered as one of the largest earthquakes, not only in, the, in Turkey, but also in the world and have uh, unfortunately caused destruction of many of cities. Uh, we're talking about 11 directly affected cities. We're talking about 161 districts that has been affected. And we're talking about the destruction which has caused uh, a big interruption in the economy, in social life, in cultural heritage, in tourism, as well as uh, in uh, daily life of the citizens. It's not easy, it's really not easy to bring it back to its origin. Uh, it is time consuming, it requires a lot of efforts. And this uh, panel, uh, this event is going to allow us to discuss how we can uh, really put our efforts together to ensure that we bring not only Gazanta but also the surrounding cities, the affected cities to its own uh, uh, state or even a better state. Uh, giving an example, I was in Haiti uh, just like two, three months back. It's been almost 11 years after the earthquake, and still you can see that they have not returned back to so rich. Uh, despite many efforts, I mean, all the international funding agencies, international organizations were part of the team, were part of the efforts, but unfortunately, still you can see the same. Or giving an ex another example from Turkey. Uh, I was uh, uh, I was visiting Rizce, uh, which was heavily affected uh, after 1999 Marmara earthquake. And what I see, there are still buildings that are moderately damaged and being occupied by their citizens. Because human might tend to forget. We shouldn't really not forget. We should really recall this and try to find how we can find solutions, try to discuss how we can find the solutions for this. That's why it's important in today's panel, uh, you be part of our discussions. I mean, not only be hearing from our experts, but at the same time, be a part of the discussions so that we can probably and possibly reach to a consensus on a declaration or a call for action. That being said, first I will give the floor to uh, our panelists. Uh, uh, Dr. Erdem Güzelbey, who is a deputy uh, mayor to Gazante. Uh, it's important we hear from him what efforts has been provided right after the earthquake, what are the challenges, what are the missing parts, and how we can how we can try to uh, to fill this gap. So uh, I'll give the floor to uh, Mr. Erdem Güzelbey. The floor is yours. Thank you.
Mike, you can't hear. Herkese günaydın. Ee, sabah bu saatte herkesi buraya geldiği için teşekkür ediyoruz. Demek ki e, önemsenen bir organizasyonundayız. Bu organizasyonu düzenleyen e, tüm e, ekip arkadaşlarına da ayrıca teşekkür etmek isterim. E, tüm misafirlerimize de hoş geldiniz derim. Evet, e, Gaziantep olarak e, 11 e, il olaraktan biz bu depremden çok ciddi bir şekilde etkilendik. Tabii bu coğrafya, e, Sayın Abdoğan'ın da söylediği gibi deprem bölgesinde bulunuyor. Biz bu depremi e, Gaziantep olaraktan özellikle 1820 ve 1896'da çok şiddetli bir şekilde hisseden bir şehiriz. E, 1896'dan e, bu yana şiddetli bir depremi Gaziantep coğrafyasında e, hissetmemiştik. Tabii biz e, bunu hissetmememize rağmen Gaziantep Büyükşehir Belediyesi olarak bir deprem beklentisi içerisindeydik ve iki yılda, iki yıldır da devam eden bir deprem master planı hazırlıyorduk. Deprem master planını hazırlarken deprem biliyorsunuz 6 Şubat'ta oldu. Biz 28 Ocak'ta artık raporun yazılmazdan önceki son sunumunu almıştık. O sunumda biz 7.2 depreme göre bir e, senaryo oluşturmuştu hocalarımız, akademisyenlerimiz. O senaryo üzerinden özellikle İstahili Nurdağ, Gaziantep ilçeleri orada ciddi bir e, tahribat olacağı, binanın yıkılacağı senaryosu da bulunmaktaydı. Deprem salı e, depremi e, evde yaşadığında deprem bizim yani normal bir deprem olmadı. Özellikle söylemek isterim. İstanbul depremini yaşayan, diğer depremleri Türkiye'de yaşayanlar Gaziantep'te de yaşandı. Bu depremi çok farklı olduğunu ifade ettiler. Çünkü arka arkaya 2-3 tane aynı anda depremmişti. Birbirini tetikleyen depremler oldu. Hatta biz buraya deprem sonrası gelen işte Japonya'dan olsun, Kore'den olsun, çeşitli ülkelerden gelen bilim adamlarıyla bunun raporlamasını en az bir yıl süreceği kanaatindeyiz. Çünkü bu çok farklı bir deprem oldu. Biz deprem olduğunda olduktan sonra yaşadığım anı anlatmak için şunu söylüyorum. Ben pencereden dışarıya bakamadım. Çünkü 8 gün önce bir deprem master planı raporlamasını almıştık. Ve ben pencereyi açtığımda nasıl bir şehirle karşılaşacağım konusunda bir korku içerisindeydim. Ve ben aşağıya öyle şey gördüm. Pencereden, pencereden bakamadım. Bu tabi büyük bir afetti. Çok şükür biz şehir merkezinde çok fazla hissetmedik ama maalesef e, bu deprem 110 bin kilometre karelik bir 11 ilde alanı kapladı. Ve bizim istahil burada çok ciddi şekilde etkilendi. Bu etkilenmede tabi şu da var. E, özellikle e, her şehrin etkilenmesinde zemin çok önemli oldu. Yani ivme, yani deprem 7.6, 7.8 oldu ama e, ilme değerleri her şey için çok farklı oldu. Yani bugün Gaziantep'te ilme değeri 0.50 iken e, Maraş'ta 0.60 Hatay'da 1.37 idi. Yani Hatay başka bir şey yaşadı. Bizden çok daha farklı bir şey yaşadı. Bu tabi bu ilme değeri yani teknik olarak şöyle diyor. Zeminin depremi e, size yansıtması oluyor. Yani o, o e, yükü size yansıtma değeri. E, bu, biz zemin olaraktan Gaziantep olarak daha iyiydik ama tabii İstahiyeli orada maalesef kötü yaşadı. Ee, şu an e, biliyorsunuz yaklaşık olarak 214 bin bina e, yıkılacaklar listesinde bu 11 ilde. Gaziantep'de de yaklaşık 20 bin bina yıkılacak gibi gözüküyor. Tabii bu deprem biz yaşadığımızda her an, e, her dakika farklı ihtiyaçlar oluştu. E, Mesela ilk olaraktan o şok atlatıldığı sırada biz yolları açmak için çok ciddi çaba sarf ediyorduk hızlı bir şekilde çünkü e, yol aksını açaraktan yardımların başması gerekiyordu. Hatay maalesef e, 
hava sahası kullanılamıyor durumdaydı. Onlara gelecek bütün yararsınlar da Gaziantep'e geliyordu. Biz Gaziantep'ten Hatay'ın sevklerini de gerçekleştirmemiz gerekiyordu. Ve bizim AFAD merkezinde de e, bu e, Sayın Valimizin e, başkanlığında, bakanımızın e, başkanlığında, çünkü her şekilde bir bakan geldi, başkanlığında biz bunları koordine etmeye çalışıyorduk. Ve tabi hem Gaziantep hem Hatay'ı sevki bu Gaziantep'ten e, gerçekleştirdi. E, çok yardım kuruluşları geldi ama dediğim gibi ilk şok sonrası özellikle e, o herkesin e, havanın da soğuk olmasından dolayı bir e, kendilerini kurnaklı alana alma ihtiyacı hissetti. Birçok kişi araba da bunu geçirdi ama tabii bizim acil olaraktan battaniye ısınma araçlarını e, şey yapmamız gerekiyordu, temin etmemiz gerekiyordu. E, tabii elektrik ve gazdan dolayı e, ekmek fırınları çalışmadı. Mesela bu da çok büyük bir problem oldu. Ekmeği hızlı bir şekilde e, gazdan tipi ulaştırmamız gerekiyordu. Aş, yemek kısmını halletmemiz gerekiyordu. Yani sorunları sayarsak sorunlar her dakika, her saat farklı bir boyuttaydı. Tamamladığımız, e, çözdüğümüz her bir sorunu yeni bir sorunu çözmemiz gerekiyordu. O ilk e, üç gün çok zorlu geçti tabii. Daha sonra daha ritme bildik ama bu sırada üçüncü günde Hatay'da tekrar bir deprem oldu biliyorsunuz. E, bu depremde tekrar insanlar bir şoka geldi ve yani bu travma biraz zor atlatılır bir hale dönüştü şehir, şehirler için. Biz Gaziantep Büyükşehir Belediyesi olarak e, bu e, şöyle dedik, e, dirençli şehir ve güvenli şehir ve akıllı şehir biz üç başlıkta Gaziantep Büyükşehir Belediyesi olarak çalışmalar yapmaktaydık. Yani bu ne demek? Dirençli şehirle yani biz e, internet iletişim altyapısımızı sağlamak, altyapılarımız güçlü hale getirmek, güvenli şehir derken yollarımızı, altyapımızı, kendi aramızdaki e, yapı stoğumuzu e, güçlendirmeye çalışıyorduk. E, akıllı şehir yaparaktan, dediğim gibi verileri toplayaraktan bunları düzgün bir şekilde kullanmak için çaba sarf ediyorduk. Bunun çok biz artılarını gördük. E, yani bugün hala bazı şehirlerde mesela temiz su problemi var ama Gaziantep e, 72 saat süre temiz suya ulaşmış vaziyetteydi. Çünkü bu su e, getiren, e, son yaptığımız düz bağ projesinde biz e, depreme yönelik çelik dolular ve bunların e, birleşme noktalarında e, depreme absorbe edecek e, ara geçiş körükleri kullanmıştık. E, genel olarak da e, bizim deprem süreci bu şekilde gelişti. E, Sayın Aptan buna ilk olarak da yani deprem üzerinden hani ilerleyebilir mi ama bir şey süre biraz uzun süre. Çok teşekkür ederim başkanım. Bence bu vermiş olduğunuz bilgiler çok değerli. Belki Tekrar size süre içerisinde döneceğim. Özellikle akıllı şehir, dirençli şehir konsepti ile ilgili tam olarak stratejileriniz nelerdi ve bunları nasıl hali hazırda deprem sonrası durumda etkileştiriyorsunuz ya da uyguluyorsunuz. Ama ayakta kalan arkadaşlar bizim burada boş yerlerimiz var. Ben yani buraya bir kontrolüm de. Lütfen ben ayakta kalmayın. Buyurun boş yerler de var. Uh, so, uh, let me continue in English. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for your, uh, for your inputs. Uh, uh, our hearts indeed are with you and with, with, with the citizen of President. And we see how large and big efforts have been provided as well. I was talking to Madam Mayor uh, right after, uh, you know, two months or three months after the earthquake. And she highlighted the point that she had uh, not been slept for many days uh, uh, after the earthquake because uh, they really want to reach out every single person, every single part of the city. So indeed all the efforts that are being provided by the local governments, by the uh, national governments uh, is really appreciated. Uh, having said that, Turkey, uh, Turkish coping capacity with disasters is really high. I mean, Turkey is not uh, a, a country where uh, is not familiar with the disasters. Uh, I don't know, you might call this as an opportunity or not, but uh, uh, this is the reality. Every every two, three years we are experiencing a very big uh, disaster which we have to cope with. It. it doesn't really have to be an earthquake because we have flooding, we have landslides, we have liquefaction potential in many areas. 
our region is uh, uh, between the uh, African plate, Arabian plate and Eurasian plate, where in the boundary lines uh, the motion that generates from these this, this plates cause uh, uh, uh, production of very large earthquakes. Uh, it was uh, it was interesting. Uh, it is interesting. If you look at the uh, Eurasia plate, you can see that it never moves. I mean, the day that it has been created uh, until today, uh, almost at a stable and stand. Whereas the uh, the Arabian plate, which is just in the south of Turkey, is uh, moving uh, quite fast every year, more than three centimeter or ten centimeter in some cases. Of course, not all this, uh, this motion becomes an earthquake because it transforms the country, it creates new hills, mountains, and etc. But it allows us to shift toward the Eurasia plate where it doesn't really move. So what is our option? To go to west. That's why Turkey is planning to go to the European Union as well. This is just a joke, but this is the reality. It moves, moves us toward the west. Uh, having said that, I would like to introduce our second panelist, uh, Ms. Uh, Yang Chang from Singapore. She just arrived yesterday. Uh, she is uh, one of the lead experts in strategic planning and uh, financing. Uh, you know that uh, just a very low amount of the buildings in the region were insured uh, before the earthquake. Of course, there are policies, there are uh, uh, strategic legal, uh, I would say, grants that have already been prepared. Uh, however, in our country, I agree that insurance has really not been enforced as uh, much as we need it. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's important to hear from her how we can really bring the uh, issue of uh, insurance and financing the effect of the post-disaster uh, situations, be it an infrastructure or building or any type of damage to any type of uh, living conditions and life. So, Yen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mama. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you, Francis, for inviting me. It's a great honor to be on this panel and um, to share um, what a bit of what we have um, experienced and also learned throughout this um, journey. Um, my name is Yen, I'm the Head of Strategic Partnership of Luxfashio Financial Group. We are a reinsurance, insurance and an insurance tech firm. Um, I want to start my panel by sharing a quote that I received personally from a Turkish um, insurance veteran. Um, and he said that insurance is the base and the source of solidarity, the main vehicle in providing funds to the economies. So I'd like to build my sharing today based on the above um, quotes and how it can be relatable to the construction of Gazenta post the earthquake. I share some perspective um, from a different has. So the main five uh, topics I'd like to share, but of course we have uh, limited time, so probably I'll just um, go on a surface level and we can have um, Q and A afterwards, or even follow up with an email um, reply. So I think I would like to cover five uh, different topics. That's insurance, the role of catastrophic risk insurance program in enhancing financial protection against catastrophic risks. The second one is reinsurance, the contribution of reinsurance markets in managing catastrophic risks. The third is um, disaster risk financing. How can the government um, play a different role in selecting the right um, methods of uh, disaster risk financing? The fourth one is on um, Manara's earthquake and its implication. Of course, we will talk about um, TCIP, which is the Turkish Catastrophe Insurance Group, um, and actions that and lessons can be taken from post the earthquake. Um, the last one is on the leveraging tech technology and innovation for the reinsurance industry and also um, I would also like to touch uh, specifically on earthquake monitoring. Um, yeah. So probably I'll start with the insurance, the role of our uh, catastrophic risk insurance program in enhancing financial protection against uh, catastrophic risk. So insurance and reinsurance are the oldest form of uh, risk management tools and can make a significant contribution to reducing um, financial vulnerabilities and supporting economy 
uh, recovery. So you might ask what is a contractual free risk insurance program? So these are established, could be established by insurance uh, sector or government and our government to provide insurance, insurance, reinsurance and government guarantees to cover the losses of uh, post catastrophe. fee. So this uh, program is started because of the inability of uh, the insurance market to achieve a more comprehensive coverage or also there's post aftermath then there's withdrawal of insurance or reinsurance coverage and causes a significant increase in the cost of uh, insurance coverage. So by way of uh, creating this uh, pro uh, program, then uh, it can cover the risk pooling, uh, loss limit and improved measurement of risk. So by doing this, uh, it can actually help uh, uh, the, the coverage of the insurance as well. And I also like to talk about the exemption from the taxes and also the non-profit status of this catastrophic risk insurance program. That will also help to lower the premium cost. When there's a tax uh, exemption, then the, the program actually benefited from these uh, initiatives. So in a way, we could say that um, yes, regulatory do play a big part in this um, um, effort in reducing the, the insurance cost and improve the uh, low penetration of uh, insurance. So the second one I would like to speak on is on the reinsurance. How can um, reinsurance market can manage the catastrophic risk? So global reinsurance uh, dedicated capital total up to US dollar six hundred and thirty eight billion as of the end of two zero two two. So the the reinsurance market actually provides external source of funding for recovery and reconstruction, which helps to reduce the economic and market and insurance market disruption following the large catastrophic events. Because of this uh, occurrence of uh, catastrophe, reinsurance companies are, are reducing their exposure and their capital base is reduced and also um, they would be evaluate the exposure and, and they would think that um, you know they would reassess and, and wait and see uh, mentality. So that is causing one of the reasons why there's a shortfall in reinsurance, especially uh, in catastrophe risk um, coverage. So I think this is um, for a call for everybody to think how can we attract back the industry to reinsurance industry and say that Okay, um, that's, despite the risk and everything, how can we sort of manage the overall returns for the insurance company? So, I would like to also share that um, the reinsurance, uh, the contribution of reinsurance to uh, risk management can cover four different um, aspects. One is to increase uh, primary market capacity by diversifying risk across geographies, perils, and lines of business. The second contribution is uh, managing the catastrophic risk. The third one is reducing economic disruption in the aftermath of catastrophic events by providing quick source of funding for reconstruction. And the fourth one is reducing primary insurance market disruption from catastrophic risk. Because post-catastrophic, post, uh, sorry, post -catastrophe, there will be a lot of uh, increases in claims and depletion in capital for insurance company. Besides the traditional reinsurance method, there's also an alternative reinsurance um, that's uh, provided by hedge funds, private equity funds, and pension funds to gain exposure to reinsurance risks. Um, these are usually uh, correlated to the credit cycle and as and as an alternative to investing directly in reinsurance companies. Uh, yeah, examples are of alternative uh, reinsurance are, are catastrophe bond, industry loss warranties collateralized insurance, reinsurance and sidecar. Yes, of course with everything, um, there's also a, we need to strike a balance uh, between allowing um, reins international reinsurance companies to leverage the potential benefit um, while making sure that the risk transfer from the insurance company does not lead to any significant risk to the insurance company as well. So. Uh, yeah, this is more on a yeah, striking a balance between having a quality 
um, protection to the insurance company through reinsurance, international reinsurance, and also making sure that these are, are in place. Um, the third main topic I'd like to touch on is uh, disaster risk financing. So there are two types of uh, pre um, ex ante financing that's a dedicated reserve fund, contingent credit facility, insurance, catastrophe bond, or other cap loan security. Then the post disaster financing instrument would, would be budget reallocation, borrowing, taxation, and international aid. Um, the next topic I'd like to move on is uh, the Turkish Casualty Insurance Group, TCIP, which was introduced in 2000, that provides a reliable method for compensation to homeowners in Turkey without reverting to government budgets, social solidarity and risk sharing are effectively maintained through payments of affordable insurance premiums. A large amount of risk is being ceded to international reinsurance markets until sufficient financial resources are collected within TCIP. So TCIP is a legal public entity managed through the TCIP Management Board consisting of representatives of the Prime Ministry, the Treasury, Ministry of Public Works and Settlement, the Capital Market Board, the Association of Insurers, the Operational Manager and an Earthquake Scientist. So TCIP scheme is, has proven to be well-designed public-private partnership program. After the mass massive earthquake, um, the regulatory insurance and private pension regulation and supervision authority, or SEDDK, estimates that a possible Mamara earthquake with a magnitude of seven or more, which has a 50% risk of occurring by 2050, will cause an economic loss of approximately 90 billion to 120 billion. Post the earthquake, around uh, Turkish Lira, three billion dollars has been paid in claims, and expected um, ultimate claims amount to Turkish Lira seventy six point five billion. So uh, the measures that are expected to be taken um, for this uh, to prepare for the possible Amara earthquake includes the revision of voluntary earthquake insurance tariff, stress tests for financial soundness of insurers. A reform of earthquake coverage and revision to TCIP and switching to compulsory disaster insurance. And ensuring catastrophic risk model are updated and reflected. So, for example, um, CAT mode catastrophic modeling developed by TIRA, a subsidiary of Turk Reassurance, which is the first of its kind in Turkey, was made available for Turkish insurance industry. Work provides the opportunity to model according to country specific building in the inventories and local condition. So, yeah, I think, yeah, just because of the time limit, I would need to cash up. Um, so, yeah, what is the action taken or lesson learned from the, by the Turkish in, insurance industry for the earthquake? So, we would talk about the change in tariff. Um, more effective claim management and um, working together with uh, international reinsurance to increase the insurance capacity. And um, yeah, and on the last part, on leveraging tech, technology, and innovation. So, um, so we, as in internally, we are planning, we are building this reinsurance as a service where. <coughs> It links the OH insurance and um, the new digital era. So it actually helps to is helps to leverage AI and uh, sorry using AI and machine learning to automate underwriting, pricing, and claims processing. Uh, real time data can be obtained and reduce the cost of uh, coverage insurance costing. Um, on the type on the lab earthquake monitoring, so. Uh, recently, I had the opportunity to visit Kandili Observatory and Earthquake Research Institute, um, Regional Earthquake Tsunami Monitoring Center in Istanbul. So, as we can see, as I saw that the real time data is being fed into the International Research uh, Center as well. So, I think these are good examples of how um, cooperation and partnership and exchanges between um, risk, uh, risk uh, research center globally, that would help uh, in, in managing 
her planning of the future possible um, disaster. Um, thank you again for this opportunity and um, yeah, I hope that with uh, collective uh, efforts we can make a positive difference in the, for the people of Gaziantep, but also across Turkey and globally. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yan. Uh, when we talk about disaster uh, management, what comes to our mind is disaster risk management, right? So, uh, and in disaster risk management, most of the time we discuss disaster risk reduction. However, we should be probably aware and conscious that uh, part of the disaster risk reduction is not to increase existing risk. So, uh, how not to increase the existing risk relies on the principles of having a proper insurance system and modeling in, in the country so that, and of course partially re refers to the building codes which need to be essentially improved and also the quality of construction it should be based on the principles and strategies that are, uh, that are, that are internationally recognized, etc., etc. But what is more important in the insurance itself. So Yan yeah, touched based on this issue and most probably I will be asking her a question about how these models can be utilized or tailor-made for the case of Turkey because uh, it might require some legal, uh, uh, some changes in the legal basis and etc. Uh, that being said, uh, one of the, uh, I mean some of the actually most important sectors that has been affected by the earthquake in Gaza is, uh, is tourism, is healthcare, is uh, uh, I would say the living conditions of the life which relies on the uh, trade. So uh, we have uh, Andres uh, on my highest among ourselves, whom have uh, 25 years, more than 25 years of experience in hospitality, in tourism, in how to uh, uh, how to heal the post-disaster efforts. Uh, in, in regard to this uh, overcoming the, you know, the sectors that has been affected by the earthquake. Uh, Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, my yes. friend, and very good morning. And um, thank you for welcoming us uh, to Gaziantep. Actually, it's been uh, less than 24 hours, but I have to say it's quite fascinating to see this, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, just going back with, to what Mel was saying in terms to how to rebuild Gaziantep and to bring different industry sectors of it, I'm going to bring it from a different perspective as a former director of trade and commerce for the city of Washington, D.C. So what I've done, I'm going to break it down in different industry sectors and also try to provide recommendations on how we can bring a solution to be able to attract two perspectives. One is going to be foreign direct investment and the other one is going to be in terms of export. So that's my, going to be my focus on today. So if I'm going to break it down first, let's start on what that center is doing today and what they're good at in terms. So let's break it down in terms of agribusiness. We know they're actually they're one of the highest exporters when it comes to olive oil, pistachio, baklava, believe it or not, and any other goods. Let's talk about manufacturing. Let's talk about textile. Let's talk about hospitality and tourism. So now, one of the things that I recommend that we bring to the table is of course, as we all know, yes, we, you know, the center is based in a zone that, of course, um, is, is, has high impact when it comes to workplace. But the thing is how we build the strategy. The best way to do it, my recommendation, is to, we have to tell the world about the center. Let's build a story. The story needs to be built in terms to why, in terms to uh, the benefits of providing incentives when it comes to investment. Let's talk about the story about who is Casiante. And second, why, sorry, and also should be talking about, of course, what Casiante has to offer. So we got the why, the who, and the what. Okay, the three W's. It is critical when going to the world that story is being told. Also, if we start breaking it down in terms of solutions, Let's talk about the audience. Of course, there's been a large export nowadays to the United States. There's been a large export to Europe and part of the Middle East. But there's still a lot of uh, there's still a lot of areas in the world that that story can be told and shared. Such as let's talk about Asia. 
Let's talk about the rest of the Middle East. Right now, most of the Middle East right now is focusing in uh, importing most of their products and services because they're not manufacturing. And also, the critical aspect into this, they're they looking for those solutions and looking for partnerships when it comes to agribusiness. So this is a great opportunity for your city to be able to start partnering with other organizations into agribusiness. So that will bring the export point of view as well. Also, let's talk about the rest of the, of the, uh, of the Americas. There's still a lot of countries within the Americas and also within the United States where your story can be told and they can take advantage of your products and services. And last but not least, let's talk about as well the rest of Europe. There's only one segment that has been incorporated into the following my research has been Eastern Europe, but then what about the rest? There's certain parts of Europe that also can benefit from this overall strategy. Now, stakeholders, critical. Let's start bringing the parties together. Critical aspect is going to be the chambers of commerce, especially the local chamber of commerce, because they want to have access to the business community. And not necessarily they will be able to give them access just to the exports of goods, but let's talk about services as well. That's an aspect that a lot of organizations are not willing to take the risk because they feel that they cannot identify, or two, they feel that the services cannot be exported, and yes, they can. So by building a strategy and working with Chambers of Commerce, this is another way that we'll have access to the business community. Also, let's talk about the mayor's office as well, because that's going to be critical in terms of having an impact of the overall strategy that you're building as a city and also as the region. And then, then we have to take it at a federal level, because it needs to make sense. Everything needs to be incorporated in terms of the overall strategy, not just necessarily for the city, but also for the region, the city, the region also, but the country. We're looking as well also at the local tourism office. And I'm going to make, make, spend a little bit more time talking about tourism. Okay? The local tourism office is going to be critical because we want to start bringing more people to Gaciante. We want to make sure that Gaciante people learn about the history, about the culture, about the food. Of course, the food as well. We, as I said, it is delicious. We talk about the food and we talk all Gaciante has to offer when it comes to the history. This is something that is critical and needs to be mentioned and needs to be told. But one recommendation that I will give, we need to start moving into the overall, overall sustainability side of it. Now, based on the studies, the majority of the consumers today when they travel, they're starting to become more eco-friendly. So we're moving into an ecotourism era. And this is something that I do encourage you to start working in a more ecotourism friendly environment. And by saying this, this is going to help you to attract that perspective, especially the younger community, all those that are more savvy that are start doing because you know what, now we're more dependent about the internet, we're dependent on our tablets, our cell phones, and we're trying to do more independent research. And this is something that I recommend. Organizations that will help you with this. One organization that you already have a presence, a strong presence in Turkey, is called International. Scott International is an organization of members within executives within the hospitality and tourism industry that actually at all different levels, not necessarily in not necessarily into one aspect of the business, but at all levels, at airline, travel agencies, um, um, hotels, restaurants. So it goes is a vertical platform that will help you to have access to every single one. They have a strong presence in international organization with 13,000 members worldwide, 333 clubs throughout the world, and Turkey I'm proud to say that is one of the largest and strongest countries in the global <coughs> spectrum. So definitely tap into the organization to be doing. And uh, last but not least, the stakeholders must work together to be able to actually engage and to bring that solution. If each one is working independently, it's not going to work. So, in a recap, because I want to be respectful to the other panelists, and I know we're actually short time. We talk about agribusiness, so let's talk about product, be able to promote and keep promoting, but identify other other areas within the globe that can definitely take business into, that can take advantage of this. Like into your olive oil, your olive oil based soaps, we're looking about pistachio processing, wheat flour, pasta, textiles, carpet, cotton, clothing, manufacturing, like I said before. Uh, carpet washing and dyeing machines, agricultural mach machinery, safe, escalators, chemicals, plastics, uh, shoes, paper products, and tourism. Engage them. Show them what you have to offer. Keep bringing them back. And most importantly, 
consider the ecotourism part of it as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, one of the and deputy mayor, I encourage you, let's tell the story. Let's tell them why, what, who is also welcome, and let's tell them the story of why they should invest in Gaciente, and second, what Gaciente has to offer to them from an investment point of view, but not necessarily investment, I'm talking about incentives, because it's critical that an incentive plan is being built to be able to attract more foreign direct investment to the city and work with your local businesses, encourage them and start working with them so they can start exporting their products and services, especially in the SMEs. SMEs are critical nowadays to small medium enterprises are nowadays and this, these are the ones that are going to bring a solution. These are the backbone to every city and every region's economy. And it's critical that we consider them and it's critical as well that we encourage them to start uh, uh, exporting the products and services. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Andre. Very, very important points. Uh, did we know that uh, the 11 affected cities contributed to uh, almost, I would say, 8.6% of overall export in Turkey? And do we also know that 4.4% of it was just from Gaziantep. So this city has a lot of value, not only for its citizens, but also for the economy of Turkey. And the contribution of Gaziantep to the GDP of Turkey is almost close to 1%, which is very, very high. And this relies on the issues that we have talked in textile, agriculture, tourism, eco-friendly systems, you know, development of the trade with the SMS, SMEs, etc. So I'm very, very, very good, important points and I'm happy that you have already drawn a strategy and uh, which probably need to be discussed further. Having said that, uh, when we are talking about the post-disaster situation, one of the uh, most important uh, point is to ensure that we have resilient and safe houses, right? Uh, Gaziantep, uh, especially the Madam Mayor, with her vision, she had, prior to the earthquake, already started, just like the Mayor has highlighted, that they started to develop an earthquake master plan prior to the earthquake. Just like that, they also started to see how they can construct energy-efficient buildings. So Dr. Gunes Janssis, who is the head of World Research Institute, is today among us. She's going to discuss about what uh, strategies they developed to ensure that they have a resilient building, so resilient infrastructure. Together with that, uh, what uh, the uh, purpose of the studies that were conducted related to energy efficiency structures were, and how this has contributed, that, and what we can do from now on. I mean, we shouldn't just leave that project right there, we should definitely build upon it. So there are probably lessons learned from that as well. Dr. Unish, floor is yours. Thank you everyone, thank you Mustafa Bey and also dear panelists to be here on Sunday morning. And actually I want to uh, first mention about who I am and also um, how we are currently working with the Gaza and the municipality. Um, actually as Mustafa Bey said, I am the director of WRI Turkey. WRI is an international NGO working to combat uh, environmental issues and combat with uh, climate change in the Developing countries, including Turkey, and we have on the uh, all WRI uh, geography, we had two headquarters in Europe and US. Uh, but our uh, focusing developing countries are from Mexico and Brazil, Turkey, Colombia, India, China, and Africa. And as uh, Turkey, we were uh, working, we are working uh, since 2005 and mostly on sustainable mobility development and also building energy efficiency. And that's why I am here. I want to quick, uh, give quick uh, info from our current project on building energy efficiency and also give some uh, remarks from the building sector. Actually, uh, building sector, maybe we are all aware, but I don't know the uh, audience. And we are all aware, but I want to give the uh, numbers. Uh, um, 
is a uh, first step and for the um, global numbers and building sector is uh, responsible for 30% of the global emissions and also 30% uh, of the uh, energy uh, consumption are from also the building sector. I am saying building sector not just buildings because just 27% of the emissions are from the buildings. Uh, from the building's operational uh, usage, like heating, uh, cooling, uh, cooling, and uh, like electrical uh, appliances uh, at our houses are just responsible for the 27 percent of the these emissions. But uh, the remaining uh, 73 uh, is from the uh, embedded uh, emissions, like from the construction uh, sector, like the production of these uh, materials for the construction, its transportation and the construction itself. And uh, that's why actually we are focusing on all uh, the sector as a building sector. And when we are checking uh, the efficiency of the projects, and we, uh, according to the recent studies, if you uh, spend uh, one uh, unit or one dollar one structure to an energy efficiency project in a building, you will get uh, twice uh, on the energy savings. So that is uh, really uh, a huge opportunity. And also when we are checking the uh, global uh, numbers, the building sector uh, already had uh, 20% uh, used 20% of their uh, potential. So that there is still 80% of uh, potential on energy efficiency project. And also when we check the data from the uh, Turkey, uh, it's more or less the same with the global on emissions, like 30% uh, of the uh, Turkey's emissions from the building sector. But when we check the uh, energy uh, uh, usage, uh, energy uh, consuming, uh, building sector is responsible for 37 <coughs> percentage of the all uh, energy uh, Usage. That's why it's higher than the global numbers. That's why it's more important uh, to uh, discuss about uh, energy efficiency in buildings in Turkey. And that's why, in line all with all this data, uh, in 2021, uh, Turkish government uh, put, uh, actually put a target of uh, net zero emissions for 2053, and also in line with this target, uh, ratified Paris uh, Climate Agreement. And also, uh, we just started our project in this year in align with this Paris Climate Agreement uh, ratification and also the uh, Turkey's 2053 uh, targets. And our project is uh, with the funds uh, from Jeff uh, Green Environment uh, Fund and also United Nations Environment Program. And we are currently working with the uh, Minister of Urbanization, Environment and uh, Climate Change. And we have also two uh, targeted pilot cities, uh, Gaziantep and Konya. And uh, why uh, we selected the cities? Because they have the huge potential, they have the highest emissions from the building sector, and they have uh, capacity and they have previous action plans related with the energy efficiency. And uh, now uh, the main uh, outcomes of our project will be we will uh, launch our reports at the end of this year. Uh, we are preparing Turkey's roadmap for the ministry for decarbonizing the uh, building sector and also on the uh, local levels for the Gaziantep and Konya. Uh, we are preparing uh, together with the technical experts in the field and also the experts from the municipality local roadmaps in order to uh, benefit the main uh, national uh, action plan. And um, before closing my remarks, I also give a uh, quick um, data from the Gaziantep. On the Gaziantep in recent years, and um, in align with the urbanization, in align with the uh, financial and commercial and industrial activities, building stock uh, increased. And, um, and also, uh, when we check the Gaziantep municipality's latest um, energy efficiency action plan, uh, annual uh, emissions.
emissions from all sectors are 8.5 uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. And when we check the sectoral division of these uh, emissions, uh, buildings are responsible for the 32. Uh, and the second one is the industry with uh, 27, and the third one is 25 uh, with transportation. So that building is also our priority in uh, Gaza when we are talking about the energy efficiency. But uh, as I said, uh, we um, as a country um, this year we also um, uh, prepare and update our indices, uh, national determined co uh, contributions and, uh, under the UNFCC uh, and also it's um, aligned with the Paris Agreement and in this um, NDCs, we also uh, target 41% uh, uh, uh, decrease on emissions by 2030. And also with the same aim, uh, zero carbon emissions uh, by 2053. And uh, actually, the uh, base year is 2012. So that we have really a huge opportunity, but a limited time. And also for the uh, Gaziantep case, unfortunately we had devastating uh, earthquake in February. And actually we, uh, we are planning to finalize the, our reports in February, but with this earthquake and we are uh, currently revising uh, all the reports. Uh, and uh, before uh, closing my remarks, I can definitely say, uh, of course, uh, Earthquake resilient uh, buildings are uh, the priority for the country and also especially for this region. But uh, and and for the Gaza case, uh, according to the March uh, data from the government, uh, 305,683 uh, buildings impacted uh, from the earthquake. So that there is a huge potential on the buildings. Of course, uh, we need our first priority is we need to rebuild uh, or we uh, enforce these buildings. But when we are making these buildings um, um, earthquake resistant, we need to think about the energy efficiency in buildings and also the um, combating with climate change, so that climate change uh, resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much, and you have been doing great. I'm sure that the report's outcome will also be quite helpful uh, for the that and it will contribute for the for the planning phase and strategies and roadmaps for Gaza municipality. Uh, she, she highlighted about earthquake resistance, most probably also at the same time energy efficient structures or buildings. This is really important just to let you know that uh, since 2016. There has been a paradigm shift uh, for, in Turkey, uh, especially instead of ad hoc kind of uh, activities, planning at first has been a priority. So uh, the Minister of Environment, uh, Urbanization and Climate Change has already adopted and also so far secured some funds uh, from World Bank and all other uh, IFIs to ensure that all the public buildings are uh, earthquake resist resistant and at the same time they are energy efficient. So this initiative is already being implemented, which in my opinion is very important. But when it comes to the private buildings, unfortunately we do not see too much. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is, I believe, is because of the cost that is associated with that. Now financing, in my opinion, is the principle of everything. and. Uh, uh, without having uh, adequate financing, together with adequate engineering principles being adopted, we will never achieve our goal, uh, which today's discussion should lead us to a point where having some strategies at the planning phase, as well as um, identification of the potential financing mechanism for both private sector engagement, for uh, overcome the uh, disaster uh, uh, uh, issues that have been associated with infrastructure and superstructure. That being said, we have uh, Dr. Claude with us, who used to be a former parliament member from Switzerland. He has more than, I believe, 50 years of experience 
in bridging between innovation, technology, and disaster risk management and mitigation. So uh, I'm happy that he's among us. Uh, as you clap, please use. My friends, well, first, I'd like to express the thoughts to the people who lost their life, who equally horrible who lost their relatives. I was surprised arriving here. I was surprised arriving here to see the apparent normality of Gazanta. It's extremely interesting that people live again eight months after the catastrophe. And the second thing was the kindness of the people. It did make people bitter. Are you right at the airport? I asked. Well, you know, I was surprised by the taxi. And somebody said, oh, I'm going to the center. Come with us. And when I wanted to pay them, I said, no, no, no, no, no. We, we don't want to be paid. Can we offer you a tea? So people went back to normality, and people remained extremely kind. So it shows resilience of mankind. And actually, that's something I have seen quite often. I was in the war of Beirut, and when people were shooting at each other, you know, across the street, at midday, everybody would have a ceasefire for one hour because they had to do the washing and to have the cloth on the windows. Uh, I was in Colombia, and I've seen people dancing in the middle of the war. Uh, I have been in many situations, I was in Mosul, and I have seen as well that ability to go back to normality is something fantastic. I will speak about two topics. One is going to be public health, and the other one is going to be the two phases of reconstruction. Public health. When you have an earthquake, you suddenly have the water systems being destroyed, and you may have typhus, you may have a lot of infectious diseases. So therefore, we need an immediate solution. In that case, and that's probably the reason why I was invited here, I created a company in Switzerland, which is called Swiss New Water, and basically we build machines which are able to produce on the spot powerful disinfectant. And actually it's a technology where we can do those disinfectants with only water, salt, electricity. And it's very important that you can bring a machine like that on the earthquake site, and then you don't have all the logistics of bringing the things because normally it does not work. So bring it straight on the spot and start helping. It's fundamental to avoid the spread of the infectious diseases. And do it also ecologically, because it's important not only to think immediately about the relief, but don't create future problems by trying to solve the immediate ones. It leads me to my second topic. When you have a crisis like that, you always have short-term relief and long-term reconstruction. Short-term relief lasts a few days, maximum two or three weeks. There you have to make sure that you save as many people as you can. It doesn't matter how you do it, just do it. But then comes rapidly a completely different phase with completely different people, which is the reconstruction. And then you have to think it long term. So a remark on the short term is the absorption capacity of the help. For example, we sent those machines to Gazantier. Actually, it was done together with the Turkish government, uh, I think very close to the Prime Minister's office. It arrived, it was with the army, and then it was not used. It was not used because there had been so much help 
people didn't know how to coordinate it. So it's important to remember, for example, that what happened in Morocco, they only accepted five countries and they tried to coordinate them. Absorption capacity. Now, on the longer term, you have to see how you rebuild. And you may have institutions which have huge money, like the World Bank, but they don't have sometimes access to everybody. If it is a natural catastrophe, it's easy. But if it is a war, many of those big institutions can only work with governments. And in wars, you have, you know, think about Syria. You have a lot of camps and some are not governmental. So there you have, for example, the International Red Cross talking to all parties. So you have to have people who initiate the process and after other people who do it. I'd like to rebound on the comment on entrances. Very often, countries would like to provide a 360-degree service. It's wrong. It's better, for example, to pay some entrance to the United Nations Reinsurance Fund, and then you have private sector people who know exactly how to rebuild, for example, a water system. Instead of having people who are not really experimented, who try to do it. So it's very important, it's also very important, I like your comment, uh, for rebuilding the economy. Things which I had seen in Mosul. Give $100, $150 to a woman who would have a small business, just a small grocery. In, and she will make sure that those $150 are absolutely well used up to the last cent. And this recreates a local circuit. So don't go in, you need big things sometimes for the middle infrastructure, but put enough money of making sure that the circuits of the economy go. I will stop here. Just let's remember whenever we have a crisis, immediate relief. Do it as you can, but that improvised thing, maximum two weeks. Then try to be structured on how you will do it. <coughs> Think of the environment when you rebuild. Think long term how it would fit also with the national development priorities, etc. Open the gate so that the people who know can participate and play on the human factor, which is what I so much admired when I arrived here. Despite of the horrible crisis, put again a smile on the face of the people. Well, thank you so much. I mean, uh, this really has been influential. It has bring me to the point uh, if I pose a question to the audience, maybe uh, when you say resiliency, what do you understand from resiliency? Is it the coping capacity or is it the coping capacity that will return back in the shortest possible duration? What is really resilience? And we all talk about resiliency, but in reality we probably don't know what and how we should deal with it. United Nations, you refer to that, states that uh, resiliency should be in six dimensions. Infrastructure resiliency, economic resiliency, institutional resiliency, social resiliency, cultural resiliency, and environmental resiliency. So these six dimensions need to be also worked together in order to ensure that we have a holistic approach toward resiliency. I was just reviewing the 2023-2028 National Development Goals of Turkey, which exactly refers to these five or six pillars of resiliency that need to be adopted in each city. But when it comes to how to deal with this strategy, how to develop the roadmap to the local authorities, it's really not easy. I mean, every single national authority or national government Together with also local governments have their own priorities at certain times and durations. 
as said, right now the people need a shelter, right? So they want to go and have a safe place before winter is approaching. Why they will not probably be thinking of they are building to be energy efficient, right? But it is us, you know, it is it is the leaders, it is us who need to ensure that they do have that safe shelter, but at the same time it's contributing to the sustainability of the future cities. Dr. Sakti, she's she's just arrived from UK. She is uh, both an academician in Cambridge University as well as his founder of uh, uh, quite influential uh, companies as well. So she will be discussing and talking about how to plan at first through, uh, I mean, without understanding or quantifying the disaster, we can never overcome uh, or estimate how we, can, uh, how we can rebuild it. So first thing first is the uh, post disaster needs assessment and especially damage and loss assessment studies related to infrastructure and superstructure. So she will be mostly talking about infrastructure resiliency that I was referring to. Dr. Sati, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for having me here. Um, so a bit, my, my own background is as an engineer um, and I spent a lot of my career working on uh, infrastructure assets and dealing with how to operate, maintain, manage them in, in cases where they're aging, deteriorating, and subject to climate change. Um, I've also done a lot of work in post-disaster reconstruction, um, and I'm interested in that whole life cycle piece. Um, finally, I, I do quite a bit in uh, urban search and rescue as well, and I was actually here in Turkey in the first days after the earthquake, uh, supporting the international search and rescue efforts. Uh, and to Claude's point, I think you mentioned that it's quite impressive how uh, the community is here today, having uh, been only a few months after that earthquake and, and to see people uh, be so resilient and support each other. Um, but uh, I wasn't in Gaza, I was actually in Marish at that point, but even you know, days after the earthquake, what impressed me so much about uh, the Turkish community compared to other disaster responses I've seen is that the, the community was really pulling together, supporting each other. You know, there was uh, a lot of help in the search and rescue, a lot of help in people bringing food, supporting shelters, uh, and, and it says a lot about the community resilience of, of the Turkish community here. So, um, I'm from an organization called the Center for Smart Infrastructure and Construction in the UK, uh, and that's all about smart infrastructure and data-driven solutions to enable whole life asset management decisions. So that's how we build things, how we operate them, how we maintain them, decommission them, and then back around to planning again. Um, and when people think of our group, we started out doing a lot around technologies, so, you know, sensing technologies, uh, so new little sensors, or using satellite technologies to measure millimeter scale movements, and then do all these kind of data-driven solutions. But in reality, the, the important thing is not just adopting tech into infrastructure, but it's about the long-term thinking. So as the introduction said, I'm, my husband has already spoken a little bit about housing, but actually there's a lot more than housing uh, that makes up a community. So things like transport, road, rail, uh, water utilities, electricity, those things form the backbone of society. That is how people live, work, how the economy thrives. Um, and if we don't think about the urban resiliency of those infrastructure assets as well, we're kind of limiting our, our system. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that resiliency planning strategy and it's more a little bit of thoughts about some of the things that need to be considered um, and some of the challenges we face ahead. So we've already talked about this, this really important need for post-disaster needs assessment um, and of course technology and things can be used to support that. And, and very often with post-disaster we immediately see a lot about a number of buildings damaged, uh, a number of structures that need to be replaced. You, know, you see structural engineers going around collecting all that information. But actually that needs assessment covers quite a lot more. It covers, as I've mentioned, the infrastructure assets that form those, those core backbone of, of our everyday cities. Um, it covers tourism, as we've discussed. It covers the need for returning livelihoods, utilities, infrastructure, all those bits and pieces as well. When we put all of that together, that then forms our, our thinking about planning for the future. So what do we do ahead of that? As Claude alluded, there's both short-term and long-term thinking. There has to be that balance. 
one of the definitions of resiliency, as we said, was to uh, was how quickly we can return um, from disaster back to our original state. Um, and really, that comes at a at a cost in one way or another. Very often, we think about uh, or the public thinks about infrastructure building as adding capacity so that the next time, you know, next time disaster comes, nothing will happen. And the reality is that's really quite hard. It's hard because that comes at an economic cost and sometimes we can't predict it. So, um, you know, when, when I was doing the, the post-disaster uh, search and rescue work, it was quite clear that some of those buildings that fell down and crashed were clearly just not designed properly. There's a lack, you know, the structure that you can see, there's a lack of things that should be in there. However, on the other hand, a lot of the assessment looking at Turkey, I think mentioned right at the beginning, this earthquake was far bigger than what we could have expected. And actually, looking at some of the, the structural design codes, some of those, some of those uh, design curves were just far above what we could have assessed. So how do we build cities that are resilient and can deal with increasing challenges? Those challenges include not just natural hazards, um, but also a number of other considerations. So we talked about um, natural hazards. There's also obviously climate change. So not just thinking about what's happening now, but looking ahead, what's happening in the next 100, 200 years. Um, because the realistically, the things we build now are going to be around several hundred years later. Um, and, and those are going to pose changes to, to the structures around us. We also have societal changes, community needs, all these things that do need to be able to adapt and evolve over time. And so rather than saying that we need to build a new city or a resilient city, we need to start thinking about adaptable, resilient cities um, that can tackle some of these challenges around both climate change and an increasing focus on decarbonization. Um, and I should mention that actually there's quite a lot in the embedded carbon in, through building to operational use in a lot of our structures. Um, and really, as a, as a global community, we need to start thinking about how we reduce those decarbonization emissions. So, um, in terms of long-term asset monitoring, you know, at the moment, what a lot of people do is periodic visual inspections, and they look at their assets, and we decide what we want to do. The other end of the extreme spectrum is that people say, okay, let's just embed technology into everything, and we'll have like, smart systems, and we'll hook it up, and you know, the AI system will tell us everything about everything. That's not a realistic vision either. So realistically, we need to focus on what we want our infrastructure to do, and how. How do we support community resilience? How do we do monitoring inspections when and where they're needed? And how do we prioritize where we focus our energy? So what should the local government strategy be? I mean, the local government has quite a lot of impact in understanding the local community needs and the power to impact those changes. There is a bit of a challenge in many countries in that balance between national and local regimes. Um, in that, for example, local, local governments very often have control of building specific buildings and, and city planning, um, but those often connect into national strategies, funding, uh, some, in some places, infrastructure assets as well. And so we have to understand not just what we want to do, how we want to do it, how the system is shaped to do it, um, and then as I mentioned at the beginning again, thinking about climate resiliency, adaptation, and how do we align all of these things towards a risk-based focus. If we can tackle those small challenges that I've just put together, um, we can really support the, the community resilience, not just in recovering in the short term, but thinking about how to evolve the city in the long term. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sakya. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll start with a bit late, so we're finishing a bit late, but we'll try to wrap up this session in 10 minutes. Uh, I know that we're supposed to have also a question and answer session, but the next session will be started. So I will kindness that the direct, which has just arrived from uh, Los Angeles, that is going to discuss a lot the issues of uh, community resiliency, which is very, very important. He is by profession, he is a molecular biology expert, and he is a vision person. That will be a to Thank you. So yeah, I'm from uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles has more than 100 fault lines, earthquake fault lines. So that's in California. California has 30,000 miles of earthquake fault lines. So you think you live in earthquake country. 
we think we live in earthquake country. So in Los Angeles, the county, the district, is 10 million people. I live in one part of Los Angeles. If you took all the firemen, all the policemen, all the emergency resource people, that's about 20,000 people. So 10 million Los Angeles, we call them Angelinos, 10 million Angelinos, and the first responders, first responders who will get to when we have our 7.8 earthquake, those 10 million people live in 3.7 million households. So 20,000 first responders need to get to 3.0 million households. They're not going to get it. And I'm not even talking about 1.7 million commercial buildings, factories, studios, manufacturing plants, so many other kinds of tourist locations, shops, retail, and malls. So where do you think, if you were managing those 20,000 people, uh, first responders, where will they go? Imagine it's Wednesday, 10.45 a.m. You are at work, your wife is at work, and your kids are at school and your grandma is home, and she uses a walker. If you are the managing director, you are managing those group of 20,000 respondents, the first responders, you will say, go to the schools, because there are children there, there are 100 schools in Los Angeles County, 500 students in each class or each school. Go to hospitals. So what, what am I supposed to do when I am at home or I am at work and who's going to take care of my family? So in Los Angeles we have a program called RYLAN, Ready Your Los Angeles Neighborhood. So that is where community resilience comes in. Let me ask you this, how big is the population of Gaziantep? Two and a half million. Two million? Two and a half. Okay, one and a half million. How many first responders do you have? How many policemen, firemen, emergency people combined total? 15,000. Those 15,000 people are not going to get to those 1.5 million. So if you are in one of these buildings, which is a 20 story building, if you knew that there are two nurses who live in that apartment complex, there are two electricians, one plumber who lives in that community. If you had a relationship with all of them or some of them, when the disaster happens and those 15,000 people here or 20,000 people in Los Angeles do not get to my home, I can walk down the street or go up into the building and ask a fellow nurse or somebody to take care of my grandma's broken arm because she fell during the earthquake. That's what community resilience is all about. And I know folks here have talked about training, <coughs> have talked about many other ways in which Ukazi and Tep can come back. But I would highly recommend that you guys think about social infrastructure. I can tell you examples after examples after example where after a disaster, the communities that come back the strongest are the ones that have community uh, resilience. Let me give you a couple of examples. Three months ago, in, there's an island in Hawaii called Maui. You might, might have heard of it. There were fires there. So down the hill, the wildfires were coming. And people were on the slope. They could either go into the ocean or run sideways. The whole, whole uh, island of Maui has siren systems because of tsunami. They get tsunami. But the emergency management people decided for some reason they are not going to uh, use those loudspeakers. So you have physical infrastructure, but somebody makes a decision not to use it. Because of the fires, the electricity is out. So there's no TV. So any emergency messages you are sending to people to evacuate because there's a wildfire coming down the hill, people are not evacuating because they don't, they're not getting the message. Somebody calls the fire department on their cell phone, they get some spotty connection. The fire department gets to the community. They connect their host to the fire hydrant. There is no water in the fire hydrant. Physical infrastructure in four different places for four different reasons failed. 89 lives were lost, but 100 and 100 were saved. 
Why were they saved? Community folks knew who, which, uh, how, how, which home has a pregnant woman who needs to be saved. Which home has small children that need to be saved. So the community folks went around knocking door to door, but not every door, the doors that they knew, which was, which was where people were who needed to be saved. Some of the people got in a car, they were honking horns. They went around to alert people to get out of their homes because the wildfire was coming down. So physical infrastructure is very important and long term, but it takes a very long time. We need capital. I heard somebody say yesterday, uh, for Ghazi and Tech, we need uh, 10 billion or 12 billion dollars to do all the reconstruction and the physical infrastructure that you need. For social infrastructure, you can do it in thousands of dollars. You can start it in six weeks, eight weeks. All you need is some planning in terms of how to roll out, and there are multiple strategies across the world where people have used it. In 2011, there was an earthquake in a tsunami, earthquake tsunami in Japan, North Japan. Three prefectures had the highest survival rate. It turns out those three prefectures also had the highest social infrastructure where people could meet. So I'll talk quickly about some of the ways that I would highly recommend the mayor and the city here in Kazinta to think about how do we build our communities, our social infrastructure. Many people respect people in politics, many more do not. So you do not want, you want to use people who the community trusts. So if you go to a mosque, maybe your house of worship, the leader there is well respected. A certain segment of population goes there every day or every week. You want to leverage them and engage them. Yeah, I, I was at the hotel last night and I saw six guys walk into the elevator with me. One of them was playing at, on his phone. They were watching a soccer game. They were all going, oh, oh, this is amazing. So soccer, that's the place where you find your champions. The city goes and finds those people who can start talking about how can the community help each other in terms of disasters. What should we do? You have a lot of, uh, as I noticed, this 20 story tall buildings. Each building can have its own little team. In Los Angeles, we call it CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. On my block, we have 44 homes on my street, 22 on each side. I live in an old Japanese-American uh, neighborhood. There are a lot of folks who are very old, in their 90s. In our community, we have built a network, like who's working from home, who's not working from home. There are four very old ladies in their 90s. So it's my job to go check and knock on their door that they are okay after a disaster. These are very simple, easy things that can be done. And you don't want to make it overwhelming for your community. We have, a, we have a saying, we say, each one, reach one. If I just talk to Cloud and convince him that, hey, we should both be ready for disaster, that's it, that's all the city is asking from me. Cloud is going to go and talk to somebody else and somebody else. So, there is, the city can create very simple pamphlets. So, in earthquake, we talk about uh, duck, cover and hold. So that's what's going to happen, you duck, put something protective over your head, like go under a desk or something, and then hold it so the desk doesn't roll away. But if you're sleeping at 4.17 a.m., like happened here on February 16th, you're not going to duck, cover and hold. You will be covering your head and neck with a pillow. If you're driving on the highway or on the street, you want to be pulling over to some some place which is safe, there are no power lines, no trees that can fall on you. Very simple thing, you don't have to wait for an environmental impact project report. In three years, it will tell you what infrastructure you can build. And then you're waiting for billions of dollars, whether from your federal government or from the World Bank or somewhere else. So, I'll end by saying, this is a very low cost initiative, and I would highly recommend you think about social infrastructure, social capital, and that's what brings people together. And what Claude said earlier, we human beings are hardwired to help each other during the time of disaster. When I was in Los Angeles, I saw the images of Gaziantep. All I remember was people digging with their bare hands, trying to save their community.
trying to save the people in their community. That's the spirit that you guys can now harness. This is a golden opportunity for Ghazi and Tep because as this earthquake goes away farther and farther in rear view mirror, it becomes harder and harder to engage people. Right now it is top of mind on everyone, people are thinking about it. So this is when you want to start building those communities, small groups who take care of each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaviraman, to make community resiliency is indeed very important, but it doesn't really come by day or night, you know. It's not, it's not easy just to say that, okay, we have a resilient community. Uh, I believe that Dr. Tibet is referring to the experience that they had in 1984, which was the Northridge earthquake in uh, California, which was actually uh, started to change many things in our life, including planning for the next 20 years. I am conscious of the time that we really need to wrap up this session. We have about like five minutes remaining. So I would like to just give the floor to uh, the mayor. If he can uh, kind of highlight his uh, views in general uh, in two, three minutes, then uh, I'm really sorry that we might not be able to have a question and answer session. Apologies for that. But uh, I will wrap up with the whole session in a few points after the mayor's uh, points that he's going to make. So we can thank you. Tüm konuşma açıkları teşekkür ediyoruz. Çok yararlı bilgiler ve bizim yaşadığımız depremi kendilerinde paylaştığını, o ruhu hissettik. Biz de Gaziantep Büyükşehir Belediyesi olaraktan kriz yönetiminden risk yönetimine geçmemiz gerektiğini daha önce farkındaydık ve bu konuda çalışmalar yaptığımızı söyledim. Tabii bunu yaparken küresel işbirlikleri de yapmak gerekiyor ve e, küresel işbirliklerle deneyimleri paylaşmamız gerekiyordu ve ortak soruşlarda bulunmamız gerekiyordu. E, biz e, bu konuda e, iklim değişikliği eylem planına 2011 yılında Türkiye'de ilk katılan e, belediye olduk. E, 2017 yılında başkanlık aktini imzaladık ve e, küresel ısınma, karbon salınma konusunda biz de bir tarihte bulunduk. Ee, ve belediyemize ait, kamuya ait yapılardaki enerji tasarrufu ile ilgili çalışmalarımız da devam ediyor. Şu anda yüzde yirmi üçte azaltmış durumdayız. Ee, biz e, raporlama kısmını da 2024 yılında eylem uygulama raporunu da tamamlamış olacağız. Ee, tabii e, EBRD'nin e, Avrupa e, İmar Kalkınma Bankası'nın Yeşilşehir'e programına da dahil olan Şehiriz. Türkiye'den dört şehir var. Dünyadan da bildiğim kadarıyla 51 civarında bir ülke var. Biz de yeni nesiller için, gelecek nesillerimiz için de yeşil bir Gaziantep için de raporlarımızı hazırlamış ve aktif bir şekilde çalışıyoruz. Tabii bu, bu depremi yaşadığımızda bu konuşmalar üzerinden şunu, şunu da söylemek gerekiyor. Tabii toparlanan ana temelinde muhakkak ekonomi, finans çok önemli ama ee, sosyal bağ, sosyal e, etki tabii ki daha önemli. Çünkü e, yardım bir yere kadar geliyor ama bakın 8 ay oldu artık o yardımlar gelmeyeceği için de sosyal bağın güçlü bir şekilde birbirlerini destek demesi gerekiyor. Bunun da e, farkındayız ve bunu da ben Gaziantep'in başarılı bir şekilde yaptığını düşünüyorum. Bu deprem sürecinde de e, biz e, yaşadık. Tabii dünyanın e, ilerlemesine bakarsak şu andaki nüfus 8 milyardan herhalde 2000'lerde 9,5 milyardı e, insana gelecek ve kent nüfusları yaklaşık %70'e ulaşacak. Bu, bu birçok kaynağımızı doğru kullanmamızı gerektiriyor. E, hem enerji anlamında hem iklim krizi anlamında e, ve e, en önemlisi de su olacak gibi gözüküyor. E, muhtemelen 2007 yılında e, Birleşmiş Milletler raporuna göre %40'ı e, Su, suya ulaşmada zorluk yaşayacak. E, bu, bu yüzden e, artık tasarımlarımızı daha düşük karbonlu e, bir e, kalkınma üzerinden yapmamız gerekiyor. Onun üzerinden inşa etmemiz gerekiyor. Bunun farkındayız. E, biz tekrar yeni e, planlamalarımızı yaparken e, bu, bu, bu tasarımın ana kriterlerini bunlar alıyoruz. Özellikle bisikletiyle ulaşım, toplu ulaşımın daha e, fazla olması, yayılar öncelik verilmesinin ulaşılabilir lik e, ölçeğinde e, şehirlerin planlamasını, mahallelerin planlamasına öncelik veriyoruz. 
e, ve bu konuda ekolojik planlar e, yapıyoruz. E, yani burada e, bence toplumların felsefesi e, çok önemli. Yani bizim kendi inancımızda, e, Mev Mevlana'mızda ve küçük düşünürümüzde hep e, ve birlik içerisinde e, farklılıklarımızı e, ortak zenginliğimiz olaraktan görerek dersine çalışıyoruz. Ee, ve e, yani bugün e, bizim e, Platon dediğimiz ama dünyanın Platon e, diye bile e, düşünür dediği gibi biz e, bir aradan bir aradanlık kavramıyla gidiyoruz. Yani şu e, herkes yaratılışta eşit olaraktan maalesef doğmuyor ve bu o yüzden her e, kesimi biz yardımda bulunurken e, eşit olamayız. Bazı dezavantajlı e, kişileri daha fazla ulaşmamız gerekiyor. Onlara pozitif yaklaşımlarda e, bu, bulunmamız gerektiğinin farkındayız ve yol haritamızı onun üzerinden kurguluyoruz. E, ve e, dünyanın e, bunu fark etmesi gerekiyor. E, bütün e, iklimle ilgili anlaşmalarda ortak hareket etmemiz gerekiyor. E, herhangi bir anlaşmadan geri çekilen bir ülke olmaması ve ee, bunu da e, özellikle büyük e, ülkelerin e, maalesef yeterli şekilde e, algılamadığını biz Gaziantep'ten görüyoruz. Evet, başkanım çok teşekkür ederim. Çok sağ olun. Benim çok çok önemli noktalardı. Sadece şunu söylememe lütfen izin ben, ben e, hemen hemen son 20 yılda e, büyük afetlerin yaşadığı bölgelerde e, ilgili şehirlerin ve ilgili devletlerin planlama yapılarında da çok çalıştık. Eve görüştürebilirdim. Ama şunu gördüm. Bana göre Türkiye e, şu deprem sınavını e, hükümetiyle e, lokal otoriteleriyle çok iyi bir sınav verdi diye düşünüyorum. Ve bence Gaziantep bu işin başında değil. Yani Gaziantep Belediyesi olarak yapılan çalışmalar özellikle yani depremin birinci e, dakikasından ta ki bugüne kadar e, inanılmaz derecede bana göre evet eksikler yok değil. Planlamada problem olabilir. E, farklı paylaşların bir arada bulunmasında bazı sıkıntılar yaşanabilir ama koordinasyonuyla verilen emeği ve bana göre mükemmel bir çalışma oldu ve bundan sonra da bu devam edecektir diye düşünüyorum. Ama, I just want to make a wrap up of the session uh, uh, in order to ensure that we all are on the same page. The points that I have grasped from the, uh, the discussion that uh, uh, all our colleagues and the panelists have uh, provided uh, is drawn draw, draw down and uh, try to put them together and maybe we can convert this into an action um, uh, plan or uh, most probably even a declaration at later stages. So first thing first, we need to have a story, as uh, has been reflected. This story should uh, should be the journey from uh, you know a devastating uh, to a devastating earthquake to a proper resiliency of the Gaziantep uh, and also the neighboring cities. Here, talking about the assessments of the damages. Uh, securing funding uh, resources for the construction and indeed a proper urban recovery framework which uh, is based on the uh, principles of internationally recognized solutions. Second uh, is the critical considerations that we need to take into account. That is one affordable housing and uh, for the displaced residents. The turning of IDPs has a crucial importance, but still we can see that IDPs that has been uh, mostly from uh, districts to the main cities, uh, they will not probably go back. At least a percentage of them is not going to uh, back, go back. And that's, that will bring an extra burden on the city infrastructure and city development practices as well. Uh, noting that doesn't have a 500,000 refugees, so uh, that's already quite a big burden. I was talking to the Chinese mayor, he said that their, uh, their population has increased by double after the week. So it's not easy, uh, because uh, you have planned for uh, certain infrastructures, 
and superstructures as well. And suddenly, when the population increases, we cannot do anything about it, but do also increase these infrastructure systems, which uh, requires a massive amount of resources. The third point is meeting the needs of the people, because this is the most urgency at this point. But taking into account that uh, the public services also need to be enhanced, and also the social support and uh, welfare programs need to be well in place. Sustainability and innovation is another topic that, in my opinion, is very important that we focus on. Where we use eco-friendly materials for the construction practices, we focus on energy-efficient buildings, we take into account the effect of the climate change, and also we promote the green spaces, green spaces, which is essentially important. Uh, best practices are already there. I believe that all this can be recorded and also made available for the uh, city of Gaziantep for the usage. And finally, innovation for rebuilding Gaziantep is something that we should definitely not forget. Uh, with these remarks, I'm not sure if I have missed uh, out anything, but I'm really thankful for our panel members for their insightful talks and also the speeches that they have successfully delivered. Their practices, their shares of views are very important for me personally and I believe for you guys as well. And uh, thank you, thank you for joining. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, but 
just I can say something. I uh, the more around us stop because it's just like uh, affecting all of us. We don't want to lose any more innocent people. And I send my deep felt, felt condolences to the families of all the victims. Uh, and also, I want to add that it is the 100th anniversary of Republic. And taking this opportunity, I would like to underline Atatürk's words of wisdom, peace at home, peace in the world. That's what we need. So thank you for having you here all. Thank you very much, Sheila. Thanks a lot. So we move on to the back. Hi. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here. Uh, my name is Sakhan. Uh, originally, I'm a mechanical engineer, and uh, I'm spending my time in automotive industry more than uh, 35 years. And now, uh, we have a consult company, and the working on the management skills and development and improvement uh, companies management skills. So uh, I'm working with uh, government as a uh, technology and industry minister, Jason uh, Masato. Uh, that's all. Uh, I will share my ideas uh, on this panel. And uh, I know that they uh, have a nice day and nice time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so we we'll move on to Kalu. Sorry for being late. No worries, no worries. We had disruption in the call program, so it's a yes, and it's happening. Um, my name is Edwin. Uh, it's a huge honor to be here. Um, the first time in Gaza, for a lot of um, I am a materials engineer, but I've uh, been also working in the old industry for some sort of years almost. And now I work for Artlabs, and Artlabs is an uh, uh, innovation hub where we invest in startups, sometimes Studio, so we also create startups internally and uh, help them throughout the journey. So we are not a financial investor, but uh, more like a, a react like a strategic investment. Thank you very much. So we go on to Terry then. Thank you. 
Congress do have tools in their arsenal and in their way definition to address these challenges. And of course, we decided to put that on the top of this panel later to turn the challenges into opportunities. The million dollar question always in this kind of money. So, I will invite the panelists to do their first uh, short comments. Again, I'm looking forward to the presentation. So, perhaps, Hilary, you would like to start with this. We open the comments. As an entrepreneur myself, I can see that the two streets of entrepreneurs show the start during the challenging times, at least now finishing. It's just like always the time is challenging. But we always saw the hard times pave the way of innovative ideas. This is where the opportunity lays for the entrepreneurs, I think. And also in a world that is always changing the traditional and constant, constantly being questioned. I think because of these times, we are questioning everything in our life through our way. So new ways are needed. We are just going through with that. And we are trying to develop our adaptation and development to be more consistent and competitive. So uh, too much pressure on all of us not only the entrepreneurs, also investors, everyone. It's too much pressure because there is a crisis, but a crisis, but it's never finished. But the pressure may be real, but there are also common opportunities. So in every case, we see somebody is staying in a life and doing their work. So those people, they are mostly the innovative and the, who can adapt themselves to the situation. So we are learning, witnessing destructive crisis in the past few years. Uh, we all see we have uh, the COVID and we have you know, earthquake and the snow condition. So we can do best is to learn from the mistakes and try our best to do better actually vote for ourselves, for the communities, and we belong to the opportunity for an entrepreneur means a potential solution for the people. That's why I believe that entrepreneurship is a driver that we can create positive change for communities. I can say that. And <laughs> we see, we find always solution and adapt ourselves to the crisis. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Sila. Thanks a lot. So, um, again, we move on to Hakan uh, for introductory comments. Now, I want to show a demonstration for this Now, uh, we have uh, three types of uh, crisis. One of them is political crisis, and the other one is economical crisis, and uh, the last one is social crisis. And uh, this crisis uh, came to us, uh, our After the crisis, uh, I know that uh, this type of people uh, having a good brands, having good models, and having good products. So uh, we uh, have to uh, think that uh, these uh, associates or people uh, need to some of important from uh, some uh, governments uh, representative or uh, social. Uh, organization. So uh, then we will uh, make to something about them uh, then out of this political crisis. Uh, this political crisis more than important social and uh, economic crisis. This affected to us uh, so far. Nowadays uh, we know that uh, in the world there is a more political crisis. Is uh, so much affected to uh, all of us. Thank you very much. Very interesting point about the political crisis, as you say, because I think that impacts pretty much everything from the past. But anyway, let's move on to. Uh, okay. um, <coughs> I think um, it's now uh, time Supply, uh, the 
shortage in many other uh, areas as well. Then we have the earthquake, and then we have the Great War, energy shortage, and now we have more in Palestine, Israel, and more to come. And uh, with the global warming, you have more and more disasters everywhere. So probably this is our new normal, like in the climate, and in business side, you have a new global uh, big issues all the time. And uh, entrepreneurs and uh, startups, of course, um, from their point of view, when they look, actually, it is probably a um, opportunity for them because uh, they are trying to serve better, cheaper, and faster. So that means uh, their solutions are opportunities for larger companies to survive in times of crisis. Uh, such as in the uh, chip crisis, uh, none of our uh, startups have been affected. They manage their way to reach uh, the products and chips, but uh, the large companies couldn't. So actually, startups uh, with their agile uh, mentality and the uh, way of working, they create opportunities. But when the crisis hits, um, I mean, mostly work with B2B some, uh, startups. That's why I talk more uh, on B2B. The large corporations who are potential customers, they become even more uh, protected. So they, uh, they try to take less risk, which is actually more risk. So this is something we need to overcome, uh, because startups cannot keep uh, running with uh, funding and uh, external resources. They need to find a way to sell. And uh, these crises are, although they should be creating more job op uh, business opportunities with large firms, we see that a lot of large companies actually hesitate to concentrate on new solutions rather than they uh, try to keep up with the um, uh, secure uh, solutions they have. So um, I think this is a barrier uh, or uh, a risk that we, barrier we have to overcome. Great. Thanks very much for uh, for there. Um, that is human to be over. We all dreams, right? Uh, we all dream small dreams. I know mean, we were uh, small. As we grow, we uh, dream bigger dreams. And uh, we want to be an engineer, what do you mean? We want to be a doctor, we want to be a politician. <coughs> As entrepreneurs, we all have visions. You know, we see that there is something missing in the industry. We want to do something better. We either create a uh, better product, or a better service, or better experiences. So we have visions that we develop, and we determine this is what we want to do. And as entrepreneurs, we build it Uh, supply 
the supply chain and discussions. So what we do is to uh, always find the local and watch the discussions and figure out quickly how it is going to affect us with our top line, with our bottom line. You know, can we have the same cash flow that we used to have in the last five years, ten years? So what if the uh, supply chain is disrupted? Uh, as my high-tech colleague pointed out, the speed of disruption in ships would be so entrepreneurs that we deal with all these issues that uh, we just have to be adapting and incorporate and revise the strategy to make sure that we can survive the adverse uh, situations and hopefully cause more impact. That's what I want to share. Uh, in this new era, 
have brilliant ideas and they have many uh, directions, they have uh, many focus, so uh, we need to benefit from their ideas and uh, they are trying to become our and use customers as well. So we need to understand their demands and uh, we need to produce our products uh, according to uh, their needs. And lastly, and uh, most important, as I said, is that we need to spread it and we lose. Trust your gut feelings. 
you have to create a network, you need to touch to the everybody with your emotional positioning. It doesn't work that if you sit there and then watch it and wait your team to create this emotion for the brand. It doesn't work. So there are different rules now all around the world. It's not only our Turkey things. It's totally changed. So we need to be up to date with all topics that occupy the world agenda. It doesn't help that if you stay only the Turkey's agenda or only your country's agenda. You have to have a vision to watch all of the world's agenda and agenda and adapt everything which is changing all around the world. Otherwise, you become old school and the brands get old and you lose your market totally and especially the uh, new uh, age, they are getting bored from the brands so quickly. If you don't adapt yourself to them, you lose. So this is the best topics for all the brands I strategically give. Thanks a lot, Sheila. I think that that's on the uh, couple of interesting points that we'll be discussing in the, in the next uh, actually, uh, subsection, which is on networking, collaboration, partnership. I think that's uh, probably how we uh, end up uh, finish this, uh, this experiment. But I would like now to move a little bit to the gender issue, the gender gap. And uh, as you can see from the description of the topic, uh, uh, in the program, uh, this is something that has to be addressed. And I remember in previous various conferences, um, there were some uh, very interesting discussions about this uh, topic. And uh, again, the description of the topic, because uh, there was a very nice sentence which talked to me that the uh, I mean, it's Chinese actually, that the uh, women are called uh, half of the sky. Okay, half of the sky, right? <laughs> So uh, it is uh, vitally important that uh, again we were lots of discussions this morning uh, about the present center uh, issue and the center cup. So if you allow me, see, I will start with the professor I too. Um, first of all, just a couple of questions before we move on to some maybe action points as part of the in the presentation. So the the the center cup. Uh, so um, first question, of course, that comes to mind is, is why we. Is, uh, is important and uh, what challenges and what problems do we face in that space? Well, first, I want to emphasize that um, gender inequality is not only a uh, moral or social issue but also a critical economic issue. There is a study by uh, McKenzie that says uh, for a full potential scenario in which we would participate in the economy uh, at the same level as men. Uh, there will be uh, an additional 20% of the annual global uh, uh, GDP, which is uh, equivalent to the uh, economies of uh, budgets of US and China total. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, uh, actually, the latest number is 28 trillion now. So uh, it's really a huge impact, and there's a uh, big opportunity, untapped opportunity uh, there. Um, now, job creation is uh, crucial because, uh, especially with the uh, acceleration of AI, uh, there are predictions that 40% of the jobs will disappear uh, by 2025. So we have to create new jobs, and um, actually we have to create more jobs than uh, the ones that will be lost. And research has shown that startups, uh, especially high growth startups, are the keys to job creation. Uh, because for a new startup, every uh, job is a new job. And those uh, that are high impact entrepreneurs or uh, fast growing companies uh, create more jobs. Just to give an example, for my company, we started with five people, now we have 160 people. Uh, so the growth rate is more than uh, 30 times, which when you look at big companies, big holdings, you don't see that kind of uh, job creation. Uh, so what are the, um, what are the uh, 
okay. what kind of uh, company startups are high growth startups? Well, when you look at it, uh, those high uh, startup companies are high growth uh, companies are usually tech driven companies. And uh, so high tech uh, kind of companies are uh, fast growing companies. Now, if we look at women entrepreneurs in these kind of companies, uh, participation of women is low because most of women uh, that start up are uh, either service companies or uh, you know, textile or sort of low technology companies. Now, how can we, uh, if there is an untapped potential there, what can we do to improve that? Well, uh, I mean, if we look at, uh, we said those high impact companies are usually from well educated uh, people. So now, if we look at the education uh, for women in some fields like uh, biotechnology or uh, chemistry, uh, women graduates are about 50%, and sometimes even more than 50%. But uh, most startups uh, are IT based, uh, computer based. So when we look at uh, computing uh, graduates, uh, participation of women there is low, around 12%, I think, globally. So uh, that's one of the big reasons why uh, there aren't uh, women-led uh, startups in high tech environment. So that means we have to increase the uh, participation of women in computing-related uh, fields. Um, why is it low? I mean, there are several reasons. Uh, now, 70% of the people that they uh, correlate engineering uh, fields with males. Uh, so 70% of the people think that engineering uh, related fields uh, are, uh, should be male uh, related. Um, if we, uh, I think that goes back to um, children's books. I mean, if you look at uh, children's books, uh, all stereotypes for engineers are all males, and all females are either nurses or teachers. So those should change. Uh, I mean, it should really start from uh, early uh, days. Um, so uh, we have to change. I mean, even women uh, think like that too. They uh, are brought up with the notion uh, that I cannot do uh, science-related things because of it's ingrained in uh, the minds from all the books they read, from all uh, what they hear. Uh, now. In recent years, uh, we've seen more women uh, in uh, companies in uh, C-level positions. Or we see more women in universities in, as president or deans, but we don't see many women entrepreneurs. So there is some movement about breaking the uh, glass uh, ceiling, but I think now there are glass uh, walls that we have to uh, break. Uh, what can be done uh, for that? Well, there are things that women can do themselves, there are things that men can do, and there are things that we as a uh, society can do. Well, one of the things that we have to do, uh, that we, uh, we have to make for women is the confidence gap. We must, many women uh, don't believe that they can do it. In fact, um, there was one study which I thought was uh, extremely uh, uh, disturbing uh, is they did a, a survey with 1,500 people, 750 men, 750 women. They asked, uh, should a woman uh, get their husband's permission to work? And uh, as expected, 51% of the men said yes, 22% of the men said unsure, uh, only 20 or uh, 25% said no. But what's surprising is 36% of the women said yes and 24% of women said, oh, I'm not sure. So this is really disturbing. So uh, I mean, women also uh, are not sure about themselves and are not sure that's uh, what is uh, engraved in their minds. And there should be more male role models. Uh, I mean, there should be female role models for sure, those who have been able to break those barriers. But there should also be male uh, role models, uh, those who help their uh, wives or their, their children, their daughters, uh, to do what they want. And um, what else? 
There are so many things to say, but uh, one, one last thing I will say is we should uh, take care of the three M's in a woman's life, uh, Mary, motherhood, and motherhood. So uh, those are things that we need to prevent uh, uh, to raise uh, many things. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Again, we move on to the same topic. Uh, to uh, ask him, I think you are the vice president of Women's and Women's Association. Okay. We have been working on the women issue for a long time uh, as an association. Actually, there are so many different topics that we try to work on different subjects, but. Also, like uh, the countries that we live, we have our traditions that which comes from the family. So first, we have to handle through with this because women try to be the entrepreneurship, and the family has the money. But normally, money goes to men of the family first. So woman has to struggle by herself but they don't know how they can reach to the money to make their businesses. And they need mentors. They don't know the paths uh, through their businesses. Uh, it's getting better, actually, in Turkey. We are happy. But before the COVID, it was better, but it fell down as a uh, business women's side. Like, before the uh, pandemic, it was like 14%. Now again, after the pandemic, it's 11. So we go forward and then fell down. So it will go somewhere, I believe it. But uh, we have one uh, private uh, fan certificate program. We do, it, we do it with the World Bank. It is the equality at companies to the men's and women's. We do it with the five big uh, audit companies, they go through the companies, they just value the uh, things that which is the questions about the equality, gender equality. If uh, you have everything is done, you got a fam, a fam certificate, which is very, very valuable all around the world because it's World Bank a, a group. Uh, I'm just so happy we just gave it the first time to the football team, to the Galatasaray. They are the first football team. Uh, I'm from Penabache, so it doesn't matter. They took the first fam certificate, so this is something very valuable. Now maybe we are going to work with the volleyball uh, committee. So uh, I'm just like thinking, thinking that maybe it's not the topics that in the companies everybody is talking but now uh, we have a measurement system so if brands want to put themselves as a certificate that we are doing the equal value to the men's and the women's at our companies they can work with us uh, through the time certificates so at least that you are going to show that you are giving value to the gender equalities and it is very important that you know how big is the women uh, all around the world as a population. If you add the women all your countries, the economic science is going to grow up because women hire both women at their work. So they create more women workers. So it means that they are going to grow the kids uh, and they give the values to the girls and the boys. So true, it means it's going to make society. So you decide which society you want to live, men's society or equal society. So I suggest we have to look through like this, then we can change the world. Yes, great. So thank you very much. So we want for 15 minutes, actually, we will be winning probably the Gustavo for 20. Uh, so we move on to probably the final question for the fund, which is, uh, I call it the million dollar question. So in the million dollar question, whatever it is, which is, 
how can the pronounce the term crisis in two opportunities? <laughs> very, very simple. So I think he, he can make some good points on this, and then we can move to the other questions. Yes, there's a question. Challenges and from them to form opportunities for growth and expansion. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to approach our businesses methodology, methodology goals. And now uh, we know that uh, the crisis are uh, happening, have a test of them. We also expect that we will face them and we will be dealing with them possibly. So, and now uh, you began a uh, resident capital strategic region and uh, uh, financial proficiency as I said, everybody uh, continues burning paper to purposes and network here collaboration based company. Uh, I'm not going to deep dive in these topics because we have already mentioned them. Uh, it's just a fundamental right now to the business because uh, this is the case and we need to embrace the facts and act according to that. Uh, yeah, it's not uh, easy to do, but we need to start thinking of the beginning how to transform our businesses into the challenges for crisis. In order to do that, we need to focus on our skills, first of all. And in today's era, that we call crisis just a cycle. We have a good one last to crisis before. Uh, but uh, so these skill sets, I would like to also mention that yeah, we look at the mirror and uh, we try to strengthen our uh, weaknesses to overcome these challenges. Also, there are, level, uh, there are several parties in this group who participate and uh, we have created various overcome stresses by like governments and authorities and we do entrepreneurs with some ashes in order to to uh, overcome these challenges as well. And also, uh, we need to uh, have uh, less progressive for the inclusions and uh, globalizing well because uh, we need to, from experience, we need to open access in a network company for a corporate foreign uh, uh, country. Uh, we need uh, these lots of barriers and obstacles, and our financial institutions are not. Uh, Changes as well, and we are still to and uh, we are still to them to do business. So uh, we need a complete transformation uh, for overcoming the challenges uh, of this uh, uh, crisis. In fact, so that's basically. that we have no 
way of controlling. So to this day, so look into the situation and turn it into opportunity based on your ability to adapt you know, will become a very central capability for entrepreneurs. Um, well, I want to share something. It's uh, a different, I think. It's a very small so view. You know, we were talking about the you know, uh, women's issues, and women's, you know, by nature, they have to raise children. They have to take care of the domestics. And they have, they have to go to the workplaces and earn money, you know, uh, they have tremendous pressure and enormous stress, you know, in such an environment. So because I was in retirement and I was able to experiment, experiment a little bit about ways to release stress, you know, we can go to the gym, we can draw, we can walk, we can do meditation, but I have discovered uh, since the last couple of years uh, uh, exercise that's called breast work. Because breast work really doesn't take much time. You can I, uh, try to meditate for many years. I couldn't really get into meditation because your mind doesn't listen to you. You think you are the master of your mind. But they don't think that they are not controlling me. You want it to be quiet, but it is easier and easier. But breast work is the only way you can influence your mind and how your mind works. And that's the only way. It takes 10 minutes in the morning. And probably 10 minutes before you go to bed. So I advocate, I want to share and advocate that you go into breast work and incorporate it into your daily life. It, it, it not only works for women, but for men as well. So it's good for all the entrepreneurs. Can I say practical advice? Uh, it's always nice to hear practical advice. So uh, we have five minutes, actually. So perhaps uh, in maybe less than a minute, if the panelists would like to make some final comments, and then at the same time, we can see people from the room. I'm just suggesting everybody in all around the world, you have to look through the new markets because uh, in Turkey, especially the brands, they they don't like to take the risks because of our cultures. They want everything to be ready to go there or to do something. But it doesn't have to be like this because you try, if you fail, you fail. So there is always a way to do what you want to do. So I'm just suggesting everybody, there is a new world and it's going to be totally changed anyway. Uh, I have a son which is 30 years old, so I see from him that they are doing totally different than us. So. We have to be just like try the new things and see the different areas, try new businesses and take the risks. So it's going to change everybody and it's going to come to good to everybody. So I'm just suggesting for the new world way. New world way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a comment uh, about uh, Generation Z because uh, we don't look uh, at this uh, generation because they are spending our money generation is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if we are look up the uh, first uh, 100 brands, they are not coming with any investment. And so that uh, entrepreneurship is not coming with any investment. Somebody is uh, getting hope from angel investor and uh, they are losing time with that. It is reality. Uh, if we uh, say to this reality, uh, to them, uh, they maybe make good brands, maybe they make good uh, works, 
uh, I'm mentally two of them in the local uh, cooperatives working with together, uh, uh, together with the women cooperative. How can I convince them that they can do? But what you said, Pooja, uh, we have uh, no too much uh, human IT. Yes, I know they are doing they are doing different kinds of traditional products and trying to sell by e-commerce. But how can I improve uh, their abilities? How can I improve their uh, soft skills? How can I convince the younger Gen Z that they can do that? They can do better in Gaza because I can say that in Gaza, unfortunately, uh, we have many dominant cities. And women, uh, based on cultural uh, dominancy, they are at the back, unfortunately. I'm uh, trying to overcome those problems because I have three daughters. That's for my motivation. And you said it is really important to have more uh, role models in men. So I'm one of them. I'm thinking that I'm trying to support people in Gaza, and I'm trying to do my best. But still, I'm asking directly, in practice, what can I do to make it more, more better? Thank you. Yes. So, I can very quickly So, please, go quickly. This is a good chance. Please give us a little more time. Okay, we need your uh, support here. Uh, actually, thank you for what you are doing, especially like here in Gaza. I am from Mansin, so I know that how men can be powerful in this city. Uh, you, you need some uh, example women for them. So mentoring is very good system. Like Kadidar, we do lots of mentoring, and we have really good examples uh, for that so you just call us, let's manage this, make our uh, mentors to come to talk with them and explain them how the systems. So it works. We have a Sula online training on our Kodidar system. So every entrepreneur can graduate from there because it's the real graduation system for the entrepreneurs, basically from our lessons. Because we tell them how we did it. Don't waste your time. Like do this like that. So Tusula is the one other system that you can do. And we are lots of projects that we do with the, uh, groups like yours. So as some examples which works, we can totally give it to you and tell it to you. So you can use it here as an case study for your girls and then actually it works. This is the best way. And also you have to learn how they can reach the money. We do lots of things with Hoskep, Bake, if there are so many things for the entrepreneurs, especially the women's side. We as a capital we know most of them. So these are the short ways. Don't try to find those. Just directly call Kadidar, and I'm going to give, I'm going to take your card and give to the team that we can manage something. Tell it easily. As a motivation. Well, a few days, uh, I was also on the board of the last year, and there's Sina uh, mentioned most of them, but there's uh, one other subgroup of Kadidar, which is leading uh, finance, so what one of the things we should give. So we were uh, training the entrepreneurs uh, how to ask money uh, for investors and we were actually bringing them together with investors. So that's uh, one thing that could be useful. But there are also uh, other organizations uh, which I'll mention. For example, Turkish Women, is Turkish Women International. It's a network of uh, all Turkish women uh, globally. And there's a sub uh, part which is called STEM Women. So this is for women in STEM areas, science and technology uh, areas. So this is especially for uh, girls who are interested in uh, scientific areas. Um, so I think they also have uh, on campus in the universities what they call campus link. So uh, they have a network of uh, women in. Uh, uh, can we show the film? Uh, can you tell them? Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet.
Hello, I am Martin Schulze. I am based in Seoul, South Korea, and I run an Arma Morphic called Public Delivery. And we have done our projects in over 100 countries. And the topic of the panel today is art and globalization. And during the preparation for the panel, I found out that it's actually a much more complex issue that we can cover in 90 minutes. But to help us, we have six different speakers, and they all have a very unique perspective. And I will introduce them briefly, and then they will give the input for three to four minutes, and then we just jump into the discussion. So the first one is Aisha Gul Kutin from Izmir. She's from the third largest city of Turkey, and she has been a single handedly uh, building up Izmir. And, um, Right after graduating, uh, Aishagul started teaching art at the university and right from the beginning she started bringing international artists to Izmir. And the point was that her students were not able to afford a visa to go to Europe and that was the only way they could interact with international artists. And Aishagul has done many interesting projects and right now she's director of the Izmir Mediterranean Environment. Next we have Dirk Van Lutel from, from Hamburg, Belgium. He's the editor-in-chief of Artifacts magazine. And he also runs an art space where he promotes the art of emerging African artists. And Dirk has a very interesting attitude towards globalization of the arts. According to him, we already have the hard, hardware, hardware that's necessary and he means we have all the institutions, we have the art fairs, we have the galleries, we have the museums. But what we don't have, uh, we don't have an updated software of the artists and we will explain later what it means. Third, we have Ethan Khan from New York. He came all the way today and he's actually a pioneer in the sense that he was the first to bring Chinese contemporary art to the rest of the world and he did that from 1978 when China was still closed off. And now he runs a famous gallery in Manhattan. And he also runs a art space in upstate New York. Fourth, we have Khalil al Dindarin, one of uh, Turkey's most established artists. And he started being an uh, artist at a very interesting time where contemporary art was kind of unknown still in Istanbul especially and he has a background of coming from a Kurdish minority and he grew up during the peak of the Turkish-Kurdish conflict and this has affected his artworks a lot and he will speak about this I'm sure. Number five is Max Feldman from London. He's an art writer for magazines such as Art Form and Art Review and he has been recently focusing on covering underrepresented regions of the world, such as uh, Prague, for example. So this is, uh, he will have some interesting insights to share. And uh, number six, our special guest is uh, Yasmin Vagi Imika. She has uh, different roles in the art world. She's a collector, but she's also a curator, and she publishes an art magazine from New York. And we will find out how she combines all these roles. So, maybe I should, maybe you can give your input. In my to this is a very important international meeting, and I'm very pleased to be a part of this very valuable analysis today. Uh, as uh, Martin already told about me, uh, uh, being an artist myself and also teaching at the university, I had a chance to figure out or see that what the young artists might need besides having an education in the university, uh, because they were uh, having a hard time uh, integrating into the, the market so when they are so young, and also having a hard time uh, reaching the international art institutions also. So uh, as a solution, uh, we've been thinking of creating a platform of 
outside the university where the artists could, could gather and exchange ideas. And especially that they could produce their arts and uh, collectioners and maybe the galleries also could reach them directly so that, that, that they may, uh, were thinking they may need an uh, uh, address to do so. So I was lucky I had a chance to use some of the uh, very significant, big, uh, very important buildings in the city center to turn into an artist residency where we uh, uh, had a chance to give the artists a place to work, which helped them uh, solve the problems that I've already mentioned. So it was a kind of thing, uh, create a big chance for these young artists for uh, creating their self confidence also, see, uh, reaching the international platforms and uh, figuring out that they are also uh, as good as they are. So. And uh, from that compound, uh, we were lucky in that uh, many different artist initiatives sprouted. So that also made a big difference in the city now, as uh, we are now, if we will be speaking of globalization, uh, well, that's uh, totally one whole issue that we should maybe discuss all by itself. But uh, when we speak of uh, becoming global, it might seem like being international, but for artists and art, being international is, a, I think it's a shallow uh, means to speak about art. Art should be beyond the borders. And uh, for me, I uh, consider an artist being on a cloud traveling around. So they gather in a cloud and then they move, uh, they uh, like drip down as a rain to flourish the soil and also take something from the soil and evaporate and go back into the uh, onto the cloud also so now artists if we can call this globalization uh, this might be uh, this is good not only for artists but for the whole world this is good the artists are so important to travel around for their own good, because if they do what, whatever they do, if it's good, it can reach to anywhere. But now we are speaking more of uh, non-object art also. So the artist is a microcosmic being, so important to be moving. So for me, globalization is, uh, I explain, my understanding of art being globalized, will be the artist moving. So, Maybe you can go next. Okay, so uh, yes, my name is uh, Dirk van der Voort, and I founded Art Dependence about uh, eight years ago. Um, and our first question was, are we going to publish in, uh, in Dutch in the Dutch language, or are we going to publish in the English language? Um, in the Dutch, there was already a Belgian uh, art newspaper, art magazine, they published in Dutch, and we decided we do it in English because it will give the French and the Dutch uh, artists and art scene uh, the opportunity to get all the forum in the world. And that's also kind of a small example of uh, globalization that we do with, uh, with art events. Now about the globalization of art, uh, like uh, like was said, uh, the art world is there. And there are more art fairs in the world, biennials, biennials, photo festivals, than they see here. Um, but the, the question is, do, do all the artists have the opportunity to, to be part of uh, those uh, uh, events, those, those biennials, etc.? And that's not yet a fact. Right? Uh, many artists are still um, um, excluded from, from maybe, let's call it the art system, and they don't have the opportunity to be part of the, of the, the art world as we, all, as we all know it. Um, and that is something I think that should be uh, should be worth uh, so it should be worth uh, about. Thank you. Thank you. So honored to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this distinguished panel with such interesting um, backgrounds and personalities and ideas. And I'm a 
I think I'm really an art educator when I really come down to it. Uh, I do have a gallery, I do curate, I do collect, um, but I'm really a uh, promoter of artistic talent, uh, visual poetry. Uh, I love to share ideas. Um, I started my career um, looking deeply into Chinese contemporary art. Uh, in 19, uh, started in 1980. Uh, officially, uh, I didn't uh, intend to be a professional gallerist. Uh, I was there trying to help find my artist friends a gallery. Uh, I went to Pierre Matisse. I went to other leading galleries to try to uh, get them interested in Chinese contemporary art. Uh, at that time, no one really, it was a total beginning market. And um, it's been a while. Uh, so 40 years of development as China has grown. Um, ever since a child, I've always been interested in uh, modern art, contemporary art, and um, it's a profession that I'm very deeply honored to be involved in. Uh, we were talking about you know, your art typical nine to five jobs. I think that art has never been boring. Uh, it's challenging like any other profession. However, uh, it demands constant uh, study, uh, research. Uh, we never know enough. I hope to the last breath that I live uh, that I will still be learning about art. And so anyway, I'm really pleased to be here. I've also been very involved also in African contemporary art in the last 10 years. Um, and uh, I've been a collector for 40 years. And um, recently, uh, because of my long friendships with some friends who are bankers, uh, we had been contemplating how art and finance could come together, and I have uh, just launched with my partner a, a new concept of an art fund called 54 Projects, which brings art and finance together. Uh, we will be looking at uh, all different areas of contemporary art, or uh, modern art, uh, from blue chip to emerging, and uh, it's exciting because it puts the next 10 or 15 years of my life uh, in a very exciting, dynamic um, field where I'm not sure exactly where it's going to take me, but we will continue, I will continue to be an educator, but I will also try to bring these two sectors together as a diversification, uh, and I think it's exciting. It's a new challenge. Thank you so much. And I just Uh, uh, like uh, six, I moved uh, to Stanford from other here to Gaziantep, and I started uh, my first international exhibition in Stanford in 1998. And after today, I work uh, uh, artist, but sometimes uh, uh, I edited books about contemporary art, and can you? Uh, I did the first two pieces of art, art is uh, uh, Today, uh, the first in magazine, right? Yes. Uh, today, uh, I want to show to you with, uh, about my video uh, for you understand my graphic how I work. And second two, I want to start uh, talk about uh, art after uh, 1989, after colonization, after learning what and how. To the cities and house to get to the world. I shall do this here again. Okay. Uh, this piece, uh, uh, 2016, I made for that in Vietnam. Uh, when the uh, Syrian war starts, uh, to kill people stand at the gate, usually the Gazian Japan made a lot of
edeni hissediyorum. Biraz sesini açar mısınız? Nefesine odaklanıyorum. Nefesle beraber hareket tekrar büyük. Her nefese. Tüm hücrelerimle birlikte alabiliyorum. Nefesi gözlemliyorum. Gözler kapalı. Gözlemci haline geçiyorum. Etraftaki bütün sesleri izliyorum, dinliyorum. Situation in the Czech Republic that 
revolves around the transition to capitalism in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and how this has affected uh, the kind of the cultural conditions of the kind of art that could be made in, in this place in this time. Um, then we can also talk about the relationship between each place and the art market, um, because markets seem to have major cultural factors, and I don't know whether there's such a thing as a unified globalization or a unified capitalism. There's, there's a series of uh, uh, different market conditions influenced by a range of different cultural factors, uh, which also influence what the public expects to see in the art in a specific place. So there are some lazy prejudices about Czech art, for example, as if um, such a thing doesn't exist, and even if it did exist, it would always be inferior to things that get made in the West, which is obviously ridiculous and a historical. Uh, so I try and focus on things like this. Uh, and I'm going to do that in the future. Yeah, thank you. Let's get back to that later. But now is the deal done, yes. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my background both as an artist and an art student led me to create exhibitions and display artists' works and supporting them. Um, I do interviews with the artists and um, I do public and private collections with this competency. And I, uh, with the help of technology, I find uh, globalization and uh, also for artists in some ways, but I also see it very difficult uh, for artists to survive. Um, with the help of technology and social media, um, art scene uh, became very globalized. And these new platforms um, more than ever help artists to uh, promote and show their works. Great, thank you. Maybe we can uh, start with a question to you. One thing I found uh, so exciting about you and your approach is you spend a lot of time in, living in New York and you are very well connected in the art world, in the global art world, but you decided to build your own ecosystem. You have your own art media, you have your own art spaces, and you're building a museum right now in uh, Istanbul, right? An art space. Okay. <laughs> And uh, you also uh, told me that you found new audiences for art. Maybe you can speak about your approach because you you are in the global art world, but you avoided working with them and instead did your own infrastructure. Maybe you can uh, speak about that. I was very much interested uh, in finding different audiences for uh, the displays of art. And we have spaces readily available, hotel spaces in Turkey. And I use these hotel spaces as a bridge to a display uh, and support artists' works. Uh, hotel spaces, as you know, they never shut their doors. They are open 24 hours. And they have uh, guests from all over the world. And for me, it was a good platform to uh, display uh, those artists' works. And um, each year, I try to tackle different subjects uh, that are important to the world, environmental issues, climate change, and women empowerment, empowerment were the uh, subjects that I uh, created shows in the hotel space. I really like the idea of uh, people coming into the hotel or passerby encountering the art, and I really like the surprise effect of art and uh, raising awareness this way uh, to a larger audience. And you made the deliberate decision to avoid the global art world and to build your own empire? Is uh, that correct? Kind of a small ecosystem in Istanbul, but it's small steps and uh, going slowly. Um, my shows were focused more on Turkish artists because we were in Turkey and I wanted to support young artists. So uh, Max, I have a question to you, and maybe uh, other people can join in. You just mentioned that you are very familiar with the artwork in the Czech Republic, and you're also very familiar with the artwork in London. London obviously has a million times more opportunities in terms of funding, in terms of exhibitions. How do you think artists are able to navigate those words, and what are strategies that they can use? They're almost 
almost incomparable in terms of uh, power and the structures and institutions that are available <coughs> and how seriously they're taken on the global market or the press. Um, London is a global center, so it has lots of articles, lots of artists, uh, small spaces, and many galleries. The problem with London is it's becoming increasingly hard for people to develop any kind of strategy because rent and cost of living, which are the very conditions that are meant to be leading to a thriving cultural scene, are so high and so expensive that it undermines the possibility of there being a scene, of there being ways of navigating, of doing creative work. The phrase goes, you're, you're running to have to stand still. Right? It feels like you're being squeezed toothpaste uh, tube all the time. And this is not a fertile condition to make it up. Um, Karma is dissimilar to this, but, it, but it's... Um, uh, it, it, it doesn't have the global reach. While education might be cheaper, and there are international masters programs, and the scene is smaller and very supportive, uh, it's hard to break out of it unless you have direct institutional relationships with state-run institutions, which is much, that's affected by political decisions a lot more than it is in London, and, and there have been some prominent cases, one very prominent case, the National Gallery of Prague, where a uh, Polish curator, a curator was, was ousted uh, under some of the nasty circumstances, um, and this doesn't happen, they said, my mum, quite the same way. They're both different from Vienna in the respect that in Vienna art education is free and, <laughs> and institutions give out sizable grants. So this allows you to develop the strategy and form space. Uh, thank you. Maybe uh, uh, Dear uh, and Ethan, you, you have a lot of things to say. And um, I forgot to look. Uh, can I? Can I yeah, yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so yes, it's correct about the fact that it's not only Czech, it's also Poland. In fact, all the all the Central European uh, countries uh, are in that situation. And I think it's also because, of course, that market has just started developing. And just started is relative, of course. Uh, just started is like after the fall of the war. Yeah, so they still have a long way to go uh, to develop that art scene. But it will happen. And for me, one example is uh, Romania with, uh, with the Cruz uh, School, with the uh, Adrian Kelly, for example. Um, and that entire Cruz School with the Gallery Plan B. That was really very successful international. Uh, and what they're doing is a real example uh, to, to uh, the Central European uh, art scene. And I think in time, there will be taken serious. And in time, that there will uh, be positive things. Can you speak about Adrian Gini quickly? For the audience, uh, uh, Adrian, Adrian uh, Kelly is a Romanian artist from the from the Cluj uh, School of Cluj uh, Academy. Cluj is a region in uh, in Romania, and um, he is now with Ace Gallery, if I'm uh, correct. Yeah. And we have targets right now. Sorry. Targets right now. Okay. And and Tim Van uh, And he is uh, he has become one of the most uh, successful. Maybe the most successful uh, Central European contemporary artists and advisors at the uh, auction go to just to say only 5 million euros, so maybe even more. But I think the, the fall of the wall uh, this is the, the moment when, when uh, the Central European art scene started to develop. And this is I think just as a brief from like that, I'd say that that's absolutely true. And I spoke about Prague, Vienna, and London because they're the contacts that I best. Uh, but it's also definitely the case that all of these places have rich avant-garde histories from the early 20th century that are now documented thanks to the show of Lacqua uh, 10, 15 years ago. But you also have a rich tradition of weird post-conceptual art, and art that was um, incomprehensible to the communist authorities, especially in Union's College, for example, in Slovakia, making work that would be completely illegible to, to anybody who would be very, very suited to uh, um, and this is what gives us, I guess, a pre-history of what contemporary art is. Rich things. Yeah. Ethan, I would like to have your input about Abu Dhabi, and maybe you can give the audience a brief uh, background of who he is and how you discovered him, and then maybe also comparing the situations of him producing work 
uh, in the Ivory Coast and then uh, to, to New York. Yeah, but well, it's interesting, uh, Abudi, whose name is really Abdoulay, is Dara Suba. He comes from uh, a very, very poor family. Um, about 10 years ago, I discovered him in an art fair um, in London, and at the time, uh, I was looking at new areas of uh, talent from around the world, and African art I always, always had an interest in, but uh, one of my friends who was a um, very, very successful uh, person in business from Nigeria. Um, one of his close friends had just become, I think, the cultural minister of Nigeria, and we were thinking at the time, interesting art funds. And um, so when I went to the early display of African art, uh, Udio was one of the only artists that I really caught my eye. There was something about him that was rare, it was raw, and he was a street artist, yet there was uh, something about him, his story. and. Uh, I picked him up as a art dealer, and uh, I showed him in Miami right away, um, and I sh decided to bring him to Asia, to Hong Kong, and also to Singapore. Uh, at the time, very few African artists were shown uh, in Asia, uh, and um, some one of my uh, colleagues told me that I was crazy to bring African art to Asia because they wouldn't understand African art, you will not sell anything, you're going to go broke. And in fact, it was just the total contrary. Um, we were selling his work at that time, three or four or five thousand dollars, and we sold out every show. And uh, we sold to uh, all different types of collectors from Indonesia, China, um, Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, um, and it was very exciting. And uh, I've seen Abudia's market grow over the last ten years. Uh, to astonishing heights. And in fact, last summer on July 1st, um, uh, at Christie's Day Sale, uh, one of his medium sized paintings that we used to sell at $18,000 sold at Christie's for $607,000 US dollars. And what's amazing is that this young man, who was just 40 years old, um, came from the street. Uh, he was embraced by missionaries. Uh, who saw his talent. Uh, he, he realized that uh, he liked the street, but he also liked making art, and art was his savior. And through soft culture, uh, he became, a, even eight, nine years ago, when I went to Ivory Coast, the uh, authorities or the uh, government did not recognize that art may be a great way to promote cultural understanding between Ivory Coast and the world. And uh, in fact, recently the president of the Ivory Coast has recognized the Moody by giving him a uh, cultural award um, for his contribution. Uh, Abudi has now created a foundation for children of the street, uh, like himself, and he's asking the question, uh, whose responsibility is it? Is it the children's responsibility? Is it the parents' responsibility? Is it the government's responsibility? Why are these children on the street? And so, um, uh, it's a, in fact, I'm an art dealer, I'm a collector, I'm a promoter, a uh, curator, but really, I think uh, the message is I'm trying to make us all more aware of our own responsibility as human beings, that we need to be aware of what's happening in society, how our families getting together, is there proper health care, is there proper counseling? Um, and I think that through art, uh, Abudia is doing good work, uh, so he wants to give back as much as he's getting, and I think his life uh, has really transformed him uh, I think he will not forget. How do you think he became successful? Was it, uh, who was responsible for that? Is it your name brand, your name, uh, your gallery, the recognition you have, or is it his talent? Um, I think that... Just to give people an understanding about how this system actually works. Yeah. No, no, I, I don't want to take, I don't want to take too much credit, actually. It really, it's a Julia, it's his art that actually speaks itself. Uh, I think it was a, meeting the natural thing that happened, that came together. Uh, there were two other dealers uh, who were my colleagues, who were friendly competitors. Uh, one was in Ivory Coast, one was in London, and I was in the United States. I think having different parts of the world where we're promoting this artist's brand, and the artist, his work was understandable because it looked familiar, it looked interesting, uh, the story was beautiful, the price was reasonable, uh, people were able to buy into it. Um, and I think uh, what's interesting, uh, one of the fans 
uh, of Abudia is the former Treasury Secretary of the United States, uh, uh, Michael Blumenthal. And Michael Blumenthal was the Treasury Secretary under Carter. Uh, he, he's an art enthusiast. He's, uh, he's a very young, 97 years old, but he's still interested in art. And he asked me the question, how did, what's really behind it? Have you somehow manipulated the economy? And I said, absolutely not. It is actually a natural, organic development of very smart collectors like myself, like ourselves, who have embraced this young talent, and that has really built this market. And that's the power. And in fact, in 2022, The Guardian, newspaper came out with an article saying that Abudia in 2022 was the most successful seller at auction in the world. That, that's amazing. 74 or 73 auctions? Yeah, 73. 73. Yeah. Uh, can ask you can yeah. So uh, I know Abudia, I know the Israel. Um, but how do I know Israel the most? It's because there are so many works of him at auction. And then I, I wonder who sells it. Is it the collectors that sell it? Do you have an idea of the provenance of uh, of the works, who pays these, these works uh, at auction? Uh, it's it's uh, a Sometimes that one auction has to go first, where 10 works of uh, are we, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a natural phenomenon. It's interesting. Like we, we as, I'm a, as a gallerist, I'm his fiduciary. So I have to try to make the best decision possible for the artist's um, benefit. And we try to protect the market. And in fact, now for the last uh, three years, uh, all the dealers that we we work together, um, and we uh, we have a contract with any client who buys a Woody artwork. Um, we have a, a contract they sign that they cannot resell the artwork for three years. So we're trying to slow it down. But what's happened is because Woody was prolific, and over ten years he sold a lot of art to many many collectors. Uh, when a lot of collectors see the possibility of cashing in. They bought it at five thousand or ten thousand or eighteen thousand, and they can sell it for one hundred and fifty thousand. Um, they're tempted sometimes, and you know I cannot control that market. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, the market is strong, sometimes it goes down. So you know the market—it's an open market. I cannot. That's not you cannot control it. It's its own animal. Because I sometimes had an idea about uh, Abuja when I saw so many works of him uh, at auction that Abuja itself offered the works to, uh, to the auction houses uh, to sell uh, for him his work. That was a bit of the idea I had. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's a very complex economy. Uh, normally, the system works that a, you know, a private collector would offer an artwork to an auction house. Sometimes when the auction house is trying to play art dealer, they try to also play all roles. Sometimes the auction house may be good or bad. They can try to step in and cut out the middleman and make more money for themselves. I think that uh, in some cases, Christie's uh, and Sotheby's and Phillips, all three of them, um, have done that. Um, and in fact, that has also helped promote the market even more. What's most significant, some people say, oh, there's too many works in the market. Therefore, he's overproducing. I'm not so interested. You know, in fact, uh, I would say it's the contrary. Every major auction that has involving an African artist, Abudia is included. So that's significant. And I think that's impressive because the auction house is afraid not to have an Abudia piece in that auction. So that's sort of interesting. I think that's maybe insecurity um, of the auction house itself. Um, or it, it, anyway, it's, it's, I think I have to be a total Buddhist and be very grounded and be very open uh, to just managing this wonderful, crazy, very tepid uh, sea because um, it, it, sometimes it goes up and goes down and you just have to believe in the artist. And I think that no matter if money is involved, still what matters really is the quality of art. And I think that's where, as a curator or as a gallerist, I'm committed to trying to give the artist the best advice possible. This is a uh, work uh, of a contemporary artist that's being offered at an auction house according to the blessing or the curse. Ah, so that could, it could be both. I mean, it, it, in other words, I, I always tell my artists, beware. Uh, I think the auction house tells us all buyers, beware. The auction house, in the catalog, if you look at the small print, they say, 
um, buyer beware. And what that means is if you're going to buy something at auction, we, if, you're, if I'm advising my clients or I buy it myself, I want to go examine the artwork because sometimes the auction house is just going to put up the piece without telling everything that sometimes they do an analysis, but you have to look in the detail. If you're going to buy something over $10,000, $50,000, $100,000, $1,000,000, $1, you need to go physically look at each art piece because there have been moments where a major auction house, I won't name which auction house, has put things up where the artwork was slightly damaged. And if it's damaged, they won't necessarily say that, they're just selling the art piece. But if it's damaged, of course, a buyer is not going to want to buy that artwork for the full price. And it could hurt the artist's reputation. It also really hurts the auction house. And I think that um, uh, uh, I had a personal experience, actually, at Christie's. There was a piece that was going up for sale, and I was very concerned. Uh, I knew the client. I knew who was putting it up. I knew Christie's. And I, had, I went to Christie's, and I said, this piece will not sell well unless it's prepared, and I was an authorized restorer of that work. So I literally, uh, they took it off the wall, and I went down into the, the count, you know, you know Christie's, where they had probably $3 billion worth of art. We restored the artwork, Christie's put it back up, and the piece sold nicely at auction. But if, it, if I had not done that, uh, it, it would not have been good for Christie's, it would not have been good for my artist, it would not have been good for me. Fantastic, thanks for your input. And Hadi, I would like to follow up on uh, the topic. All the major auction uh, houses are in the big cities like New York, London, and uh, Hong Kong, for example. And you have so much experience over the last uh, 20, 25 years building your career, especially abroad. And you have worked in the art house spots like Berlin, for example. You had many projects there. In your experience, in the last 20 years, has globalization made the art world more inclusive or not? And you have an exhibition in uh, Martin coming up, correct? And, and maybe you can uh, tell the audience uh, where, where you think the power has went. Has, has, um, have cities like Berlin become stronger or New York? Or is the power more evenly distributed right now? Okay. Um. When I am in London, I work at uh, the story of uh, exhibiting, story of creating, and story of how the art and culture change the uh, cities and countries. Uh, yeah. We have four time, just I want to start my point. Uh, 1998, when the Berlin Wall demonstrated, the same year, uh, Jean Michel Huber, uh, his first time make exhibition. Um, um, Santa Pompidou, the title is Megidius, uh, Megidius, then Terra. This exhibition, first time in Western world history, Terra uh, take the global uh, uh, many countries. It was a legendary exhibition where one curator was traveling yes, around the world and, and it was the first uh, global exhibition. Yeah. Terra uh, destroyed the long history of historic books. And then uh, uh, open doors for new art, art story writings. First time we see artists from uh, uh, Far East, Africa, uh, um, China, everywhere. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, after uh, John Little uh, exhibition, I remember uh, 1997, uh, Wuhan, who was the big city on the wall. And this is also a very important for the exhibited history. For uh, the first time exhibited art could not do art. And art uh, inside the city, the everyday life, and um, new forms. Um, uh, last two months, uh, I am all time very happy when I am soon I participate in Sao Paulo Biennale. Sao Paulo Biennale 1998. Uh, the concept is a thousand times how the Western world, like the Eastern world, culture and how they are architect and, and yeah, about this. And last one, 2002, also uh, Wuhan and Trans Asia Development Work in Vienna. Also, the 
first exhibition, the expected uh, not only artists but also artist collectives. From uh, it, personal but also groups of and it's also from the uh, historic exhibitions. Uh, of the public documentation is also uh, the center of art of China. Because before 1998, we say London, uh, New York, Paris, Asia. But after globalization, uh, for example, if very good artists come from Gaza, we say Gaza is a Because we have this very important artist that very remote of the country, as was in America. Because before the globalization, we do not be good artists, we must be badly. So not that we must have uh, parts or here, but now we are here everywhere. Uh, Do you think the artist's life has become easier because of this? The process is not about easier or uh, it's about the methods change. For example, not for the public part. Yeah, before we also have the globalization, uh, the demonstration also the globalization. For example, uh, Arabs and Greeks start from social media. Social media also after the internet and the outright when the demonstration start, people first read from TV and this is very similar. Um, and same years going to Istanbul, Mahana Shaja Vienna, the most important uh, Vienna in the world. Because before we don't just the Jakarta Venice. There is our problem on theaters in Pakistan. For example, we start together now, we will do Thai. Do you participate in China? Uh, yes, but uh, also. <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe you can uh, give some input and also you about uh, the importance of cities in this uh, specific moment compared to 20 years before, 15 years before. You can speak about Istanbul and you can speak about Istanbul. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I would like to uh, add a few words for the discussions earlier, yes. especially when uh, Max uh, spoke about the uh, impact of the I was also brought to my mind uh, the social activism, maybe, and uh, that might be uh, another uh, hallway for arts and artists to, you know, art market as well. And that might be a good subject to discuss also. I'm sorry it was, we had to, you know, we uh, might have another occasion to discuss about, about that. You, you, you try to establish Izmir as an art city and yes. you feel you have succeeded and... Yeah, actually uh, also about uh, the, uh, the talent and the globalization, I would like to speak over that issue which we discussed earlier, which was discussed earlier connected to my city as well, because um, in my city, 20 years ago, maybe even more, there were, we had, uh, uh, we still have uh, very important universities of fine arts, and as I said earlier, we had a big potential of young artists, and uh, they could not have the, the a possible platform in Disney, and they have to flee to Istanbul or maybe to Europe, uh, and uh, because there was not a, a market in Izmir, so that was a discussion then uh, that if there's no market pressure over the artists, maybe they uh, are more creative. Uh, that I wish we could discuss as well because. Uh, your example of uh, Abu Yah, yeah. uh, when you uh, reached him, uh, the, the most valuable thing I guess I would estimate about him was probably there was not a, no pressure over him, so he was free to create whatever he felt like. And uh, additionally, for uh, let's say the Western world, uh, something local. Everything local and sincere is always uh, very creative and unique. So that makes um, a big difference for artists to create, especially 
maybe with uh, the east, uh, eastern, uh, like uh, when the, the wall uh, was broken, that was a new uh, understanding, new blood, which was not, uh, had, had not been created for the capitalistic market. So that, I guess that makes a huge difference in today's art as well. I mean, in Berlin and uh, in, uh, in the, after the wall has been broken, things have changed a lot. So that is I, actually uh, in economics also, with arts or whatever else, uh, this is an important subject to be discussed. Uh, around uh, the big discussion around the capitalistic way of uh, uh, economy and the, the possible or hopeful change by time to uh, some more so socialistic uh, changes. Well, speaking of my city, uh, my city, uh, yes, uh, we did not have the market, but we had a big potential of artists. And that was my target, to have these artists, have, to have them uh, the possibility to create easily, uh, produce easily, and then uh, uh, arrange a platform where they could reach the collectioners or galleries, whoever would buy, uh, for a direct uh, connection. In Izmir. So it made a big difference. So they did not have to run after uh, the market. And that uh, sometimes many of the talented young artists had to give up because they didn't have the, the means for that. Uh, now, Izmir is a platform where whoever wants to reach uh, uh, good, a talented artists, they could come, directly see them, reach them. So. I'm very proud that I had uh, a, a t to trigger this in this year. So now there are a lot of artist initiatives, little platforms, and there are some groups of artists who just like invaded, but then that's uh, with the will of the both sides. Some uh, uh, neighborhoods like getting into the houses, reaching people. So they created their micro platforms for creating art, which is very, uh, very creative. So, uh, and uh, now it's uh, flourishing. And in very short time, I'm sure this will be uh, an important art uh, uh, platform or scene uh, for creative uh, young talents. And then I guess that might be a new blood to the market as well. So uh, Izmir now, uh, I also with the respect team, we are working now. Uh, they are very much into, uh, we, we are working to produce uh, uh, like something like, it's called financial project, but it's not to give money to the artists, it's to prepare platforms for artists to be able to work because that is one of the most essential things and in the United States we know how things changed when uh, the state gave uh, big places for artists to, uh, just, to just to produce. Uh, they should not think of selling their works, they should be supported to produce. They should not, I mean artists, to, speaking of artists' work, Selling in the market is a bit, for me, a bit disgusting. I mean, not this. I mean, should be. It's so it's, now we are in the contemporary art. We are speaking of uh, non-material art. I mean, artists should be so divine by its own microcosmic thing, and she should be supported with whatever. I mean, to. Uh, I. I'm sorry. Maybe it's not uh, the platform to speak of this, but I, this is what I imagine. Yeah, I imagine. Right. Uh, also, um, Turkey compared to other metropolitan, Istanbul compared to other metropolitan cities, of course, the um, contemporary art scene is developing rapidly. Um, however, um, I think what we are lacking could be 
Um, what I like in New York is the open studios that you can visit those studios. There are huge uh, studio spaces, artists work. You can go there, visit them, watch them, how they work. And then if you want, you can buy it, you can do networking. And uh, what third is lacking is art in those uh, spaces. But also, Istanbul as an art hub, uh, which it is, uh, it's very expensive for an artist to survive, just like how um, expensive like New York is. Um, therefore, I think um, cities like Istanbul, uh, Turkish contemporary art scene definitely needs more support from art countries and uh, leaders and the government especially uh, to put on more shows, more fairs. We have a Biennale, it's really important, it's really going well, but um, these areas definitely need some support to become a better yes. art house. Um, also, it's <coughs> It's a lot of space for an artist to live, but uh, there also the market is different. So um, I think each city or country they all have different needs and people should uh, cater according to those uh, different needs each county or city has. Thank you. Halil, I have another question for you. When you speak with others, there is often uh, an issue of inspiration. And if yes, artists now can research everything and it's almost like a situation where everything has been done and you just shared some of your new project with me and we immediately uh, can reference back to Wendy who has produced some similar work in the 1970s. My point is we have access to so much information and how does an artist find a unique voice in 2023 and beyond? Yeah, sure, sure. My artistic project, well, I started out that um, I focus every day night and when you Every day night because I'm not studio arts, just in a very basic mood. I go to street and stand on 22 million to follow me. When I go to stand on street, it's called the big library. And when I go, I see my big, I create the city place sometimes. And the world of the city and the critics. For example, in 2013, I make this video about the application of from one people to the school for Istanbul. Because when in Turkey, the generation started there, go to just start the Roman people area, who are very poor. There are 400 year old live near the door of Istanbul, where Pak Sultan is from Istanbul. They are still the same, but the generation started in the city and this uh, woman used to make Roman uh, music, but I found three kids that make hip hop and the people that are burned inside uh, demolished homes and their music, their personal journey and how they are seen. Uh, and, and just I read the newspaper, their story, and I go to that's directly the school today, I read them, and we make film with them. And after this film, one more day to go to the old world trail because the, when I make to this rap, before I arrived, because it, uh, you know, if you hip hop and rap in English, but if you make to this rap, then, but there are words uh, uh, very strong. And when this goes to one from New York, then in the early language, there are in some type of work for them, right? Because it's very strong. Uh, done for music and also when I saw this beginning video also this is when Syrian refugees and crisis start we make this piece yeah this about every day we see TV read uh, newspaper because many skin from newspapers and TV uh, I mix reality and mix them together when you take the uh, like art piece and people Reading and uh, like that. I used this time. And these days, uh, one one uh, week before Palestine, uh, Palestine and Israel war, I started new book. But unfortunately, one week later, it realized I bought with uh, uh, army bronze. You know, who, 
say it too often. They are, they are very clever, uh, work with AI, and she just be comfortable and go to the front. Those last four uh, work in near this area, Ukraine, Russia, Libya, and other things that are just work this issues. And you remember when the third round uh, the come to our life in the beginning of 90, just unless these people uh, make drones, they will go up and put the subs and say and send CNN. Because how other things are always fine. In Turkey? Yes, for four years. Four years was now sometimes I want to uh, repeat the question to you too, because uh, you both represent artists. And uh, recently I spoke to Karina Kaikon. She's one of the most established artists from Finland. And she's in her early 70s. And we spoke about some similarities of her work to other artists who produced work in the 1980s. And there was no art media. And they just happened to both use discard material but when we see it now, it looks very similar. And my point is that now in 2023, she would know the work, she would have researched it, and she would not produce the same work. And how can artists stay original in, in these times? Well, I think that originality, um, you know, so many artists from the beginning of time who always learn from other artists, who've always been influenced by others. Um, Picasso, for example, Learned that he borrowed, and he said a good artist can borrow and steal others. Um, I think knowing art history, informing your eye, um, um, I think that even if an artist copies another artist, um, uh, it can be there can be something quite different. I think that not, everything has not been invented. There's always something new to add to the of art. Uh, sometimes, like for example, in Chinese ink drawings or line making or I mean, you think of all the different artists from, from art history who made markings and um, um, paintings and paper that everything has probably been done. Artists consistently that I've seen every year are making something different. And I think that one of the great things about Chinese art maybe right now, you know, in forty years ago it was quite you know low. It became grew and grew and grew in two thousand seven. Uh, it was at a very good high level, and then the economy moved first in 2008 and went down again. And now, because of the, what's happened in Chinese society today with Xi Jinping putting such a grip on society, still, I think tomorrow or next year or in a few years, you're, we're going to see emerging Chinese artists again because the intelligence is there, the schooling is there, education is there. And I think artists are, are uh, even under duress, are very creative. And I think that um, uh, you know, even t when times are difficult, uh, you will be surprised. Artists are such amazing innovators that they will always come up with something fresh and new. But, but do you understand correctly this is your question? Uh, can artists avoid making copies? Exactly. Uh, without knowing. Yeah. yeah. Or it's being heavily inspired. Heavily inspired. Well. Um, the same, first of all, there is because this, this is a conversation that I have with a lot of artists that a lot of artists steal from uh, other artists. And yes. that they, you have some story about uh, Jeff Koons. Yes, yes. But first I'd like to refer to your uh, Finnish artist. Mm -hmm. uh, the Finnish artist. Uh, because she cannot, uh, she cannot help and you cannot know uh, anything. And it can happen that uh, someone makes a uh, work aligned as an existing one. It's the same with music. I mean, you can never pull this out. Uh, but when it is done on purpose, uh, I'm talking first of all an example in Belgium. You have, you have a very important artist in the um, And uh, he made uh, a painting of a Belgian politician. I think the title is also called Belgian, a Belgian politician. And it was uh, a fragment copy of a photo made by uh, a Belgian photographer. And he never referred to, to that photographer. And it almost ended in court, but they made an agreement. But that is a very long copy. It's also a little bit what Jeff Kuhn does. He also makes kind of copies, 
but he, he, uh, he gives it his own, his own touch. And in most of the cases, he refers to, uh, to the artist, uh, like I made uh, the, the, the case in Waltz, uh, to Kieran Dio or Rubens. But sometimes he also forgets, he doesn't do it. I have a, a small example, uh, the Cite Barbina that was inflated at the Rockefeller uh, Plaza. Um, the original piece was made by a Ukrainian artist called Oksana Zdimut. Um, she died uh, 50 years ago or so. And someone comes to me and says, Derek, this is a copy of, uh, of uh, a work by Oksana Zdimut, a uh, Ukrainian artist. I addressed uh, Gagosian uh, about this. I addressed uh, Chef Kuz about this. And uh, there was never a real answer. Uh, we published about this. But the fact that he does this, that he makes that copy, that's okay, that's okay. But he should, he should mention uh, the name of Osama Zimbu, like he does with humans. Because of course, maybe he thought no one knows Osama Zimbu. Uh, everybody knows humans. When people look at the gazing ball of humans, people say that's humans, you cannot uh, not say it's not the humans. But Osama Zimbu, nobody knows. And I followed that story very much because we got the world press with this. And um, it ended up that I bought the original piece of Oksana's new book uh, from the grandson of Oksana's new book. And that's uh, a piece of, of uh, it's a porcelain statue that I would never have bought uh, when I see it on the market. But uh, I bought this and it's the, the most important piece of, of art that I now possess. But that's, that's a kind of a, an example of that like copy without without uh, giving edit to the voice of an artist. Um, I have another artist who I've been collaborating with for more than 15 years. His name is Eric uh, Dorner. Um, and Eric Dorner, uh, his whole art practice is to copy other artists and to live the other artists, to admire the artists, to... And so, for example, uh, he, he actually, Eric Dorner, uh, in fact, uh, he's, he's known to sell... I first met him in front of the Scope Art Fair in Miami 15 years ago. He was selling flagrant copies of Andy Warhol, um, Jenna Coons, Vivienna um, Hearst for $25. And finally, um, and actually it was sort of fun, you know, for $25. I can buy a lookalike that's signed by Eric Dormer, and you know it's a flavor, but he was not hiding it. He was being honest. And what's so interesting, though, he is an academic. He could make his own artwork, but he's so good at making other people's artwork. It's fascinating. So, for example, we had a project. Uh, I love Onkwara, for example. I didn't have the budget, but Onkwara. So, in fact, for 60 days, he had a project. I woke up. You know, Juan Clara used to say, I'm alive, and send postcards to everyone, all his friends. So Eric decided to send postcards to me, 60, oh, 60 days, two months, every morning he would wake up. I woke up at 7.45, I woke up at 6.30, I woke up at 8.15. And so he sent me 60 cards, and I received in the mail 59. I lost one in the US mail, but I had these cards, and so it went, even though it was a copy of Juan Clara, it was really